Hello and welcome to Lordub, the show where we take someone who hasn't played a game and walk them through the full story. My name is Monty Zander, I'm your host today, and I am joined by Neil. Hello. And Chase. Let's get real high in the sky. <laughs> Tee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we're starting off strong. Great. Um, so, if this is your first episode, we have been covering some Bioshock stuff recently. Um, I have been leading uh, the troops through Bioshock 1, Bioshock 2. Uh, we're now on to Bioshock Infinite, and after this we'll be doing Burial at Sea. This is the one that I am most excited to show you, Chase, because you have played a little bit of it, but not enough to know anything, right? I've played... I'm trying to remember. I remember... I, I, I want to say it's like the first two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I remember getting up to, I do not for the life of me remember the name of the city, but I think it starts with a C. Am I right? Yes. Yeah! Concord? Nope, not gonna oh, tell you yet. Not gonna yeah. tell you. Okay. Um, I remember going through like a fairground with a lot of slaves. It was really racist. Yep. <laughs> it was really fucking racist. Um, I remember meeting Elizabeth and I think that we got shot out of the sky. Okay. Um, and then I think that's where I stopped playing. Do you remember anything about, like, what Elizabeth's deal is? I don't think that I've learned anything about her deal. I think that awesome. I literally just met her. That's exciting. That's very And I don't, I don't fully actually remember the circumstances mm -hmm. under which I met her. Perfect. So. Perfect. That's, that's where I'm going at. Why did you stop playing? Is it because it's a shooter? Uh, maybe. Okay. Um, I, I don't fully remember. This one was... God, it must have been like six, eight years ago when I played this. 2013 was, this came out. Yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a long while ago. It was closer to when it came out that I played it. It was probably the shit. <laughs> probably the shit. Fair enough. Was... I feel like I'd, I'd play it today. I'd be more into it today than I was then. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you'll try this one like you tried Bioshock 1 after we go through the story. Because you're either going to love this or you're going to hate this. I honestly don't know which way you're going to go. Um, Interesting. Neil, what do you know about it? Um, so I played the whole of this game when it came out. We played it too. I think we were living together, Monty, oh, and I, oh. I think we both played it. Um, I, in my head, I remember all of it, but as I, we always find out in these things, I, that means probably about 30, 40%. Like I remember <laughs> the beginning, the bit of the middle and the end. Um, I, I know that this game, I'll careful how I talk about this in the first 50 minutes of the video because I don't want to get us demonetized, but I know that this game, we have to thank uh, anyone who's a fan of sort of uh, modern 3D adult imagery on the internet um, this game was this this <laughs> yeah! this this game was the catalyst for the new technology that is used, um, but I won't say exactly what I remember because I think it's most stuff. But again, I'm prepared to be surprised with having forgotten large swaths of it. I think that that's the most fun fun fact that we've ever had on the show. Mm. Well, the Bioshock Infinite inspired. Like, no, 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 not inspired, revolutionized yeah. oh, I didn't know the this. porn yeah, industry. So like modern, <laughs> modern, modern sort of 3D uh, images and videos mm -hmm. that kicked off with uh, adult content being made about Bioshock like, it Infinite. Was, it was a like several generational gap between what was before to after Infinite. I feel like all the stuff that comes out for like Overwatch and stuff now, any of that is all built on the same models that started with Infinite. So I will tell you right now that Elizabeth is top three video game characters of all time for me. Fascinating. So that makes me very unhappy <laughs> knowing all of that exists because yeah. I do, not in a romantic way, I just think she's awesome Elizabeth and fascinating. Yeah. Um, and and the, the tech behind how they made Elizabeth in this game was also revolutionary. Um, well, Chase, Chase explained waifus to me yesterday. So, you know, maybe it's okay that people have Elizabeth as a waifu. Is that right? Is that, that is that is. Correct, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, okay. there you go, you nailed it. But yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Elizabeth is a, a phenomenal character. Talk to your wife, Um And uh, Booker is fine. Yep. Um, Booker is... Oh, I forgot his name was Booker. Yeah. So, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, Bioshock Infinite, as we discussed, is very polarizing. Some people fucking love this game. Some people despise this game. People, history has not been kind to Infinite the way it's been kind to Bioshock 2. I thought I remembered it getting like really warm reception when it, it came out. It got great it reviews. It did. So I've got two reviews for you to give you a sense of how the scales <clears throat> fit, right? Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. These are user reviews, by the way. We're not doing critic reviews because they are boring and normal and these and are silly and fun. <laughs> and all 9 out of 10s. Uh, this is a 10 out of 10 review. 
um, on Metacritic, which reads, It is impossible to play through this game and think that video games cannot be art. From beginning to end, Bioshock Infinite is a wonder to behold. The attention to detail placed on every single aspect of the game is stunning, with everything from lighting to timing to music and all the visuals in the game directed solely toward realizing Ken Levine's creative vision. Bioshock Infinite is the Mona Lisa of video games. Damn. <laughs> right. well, if, to be fair, I love this game. It is not the Mona Lisa of video well, games. Fair, uh, what, like slightly, slightly overrated and too many people like it? Remembering what I remember of it at the time it came out, I could see this review at the time it came out. I don't know if I would agree these days. 2020. <laughs> was when that review came out. Oh, 2020. Many games have come out since then. Many, <laughs> many great games. More Mona Lisa uh, games. At least 12. Your games your favorite Mona Lisa, Breath of the Wild, came out since then. Mm, yeah, that. Yep. Uh, so here's another one, uh, which is four out of ten. So interestingly, on Metacritic user reviews, I couldn't find a one out of ten. Maybe just they weren't loading for me. This is the lowest possible score I found. Right. And what it was reads? it again? Four out of ten. Okay. Written in 2020. Very bad. We're pretty pretty bad for Metacritic, yeah. It's bad, um, but it feels like a four feels like it's like fairly bad. Like that feels like they I think off. if someone's found gave me a tip four out of ten, I'd still be pretty devastated by it. No, don't even say anything. I can see you preparing. Sorry. So four out of ten review written in 2010, uh, 2020 opens with our favorite word that we like to hear in reviews nowadays that make us think that this is probably gonna be quite an insightful review. All in capital letters, woke! Oh no. <laughs> oh no. no. After when was this review from? Twenty twenty. Okay, that's, that makes Woke. sense. After Bioshock 1 and 2, what a letdown. Game is heavily offensive to Christians and goes nowhere with it. Just imagine how it would be panned if any other religion was used as a base. Odd changes like no map, bad level design, both of which I agree with, with a lot of backtracking and heavily linear progression. Weak main characters and antagonist, lots of bugs. Also, woke. <laughs> No reference to what the wokeisms are, but it's I fine. Just one thing I'm getting out of that. I I do find it curious. Maybe perhaps it's just the games I play that it does feel as if Catholicism is the basis for any time there is evil religion in a game. Which, granted, raised Catholic. I don't mind that. <laughs> That's fine. But Bioshock Infinite. Released in 2013 after six years in development, which nowadays doesn't seem like a long time. For this time, it was a oh, long time. Okay, it was like time. a two-year turnaround for sequels normally, at least uh, that the longest, wasn't it? Pretty much right after Bioshock 1 released, Ken Levine and Irrational Games went on and started the concept phase, leaving 2K Marin to make Bioshock 2, which we covered in the last episode. This was a rocky development process. The art book, which I do have somewhere and I'll give to you in one of the breaks, details a bunch of cut content, which, to be fair, isn't unusual for like any video game, but there were release date delays, crunch, uh, like a crap ton of crunch, a bunch of senior developers exited the project during it, a whole host of trailers showed footage, set pieces, and even characters that we never got in the game, and it was a mess. So for example, there is a moment, um, and you can find this clip online, it was from like an E3 demo, where the player goes and finds a character called Saltonstall, who is running for mayor or something. And he is standing outside with a bunch of boards, which are anti-immigration boards. And he's preaching about the foreign hordes and how they're coming in. And, you know, he, and he's because he's had a vision of the future and they're going to come and destroy Colombia. And the player can... Columbia. Columbia. That's what it was called. I do remember that. And the, the player can kill, kill that character. And oh. that character had like audio logs and script stuff written. We never see that character in the actual game. So a bunch of stuff was cut. But then in 2013, after many delays, we got it. The Bioshock to end all Bioshocks, Bioshock Infinite. This is a different kind of game from 1 and 2. So it's still a first person shooter, you still get your space powers, but unlike when we looked at Bioshock 1 and 2, there was more of a narrative that you follow, there's more dialogue, there's more people talking, there's more action happening, yeah. um, rather than just piecing together events of the past. And we've got a protagonist that actually speaks, correct? Yes. yes. So while I'm going to show you some audio logs and stuff, that's not going to be the focus this time. This is going to act as a more traditional lore dump where I've got a story to tell you. Mm -hmm. Characters are doing things. Let's find out what they're doing. So, you ready? Yeah. Let's go. Part one. He doesn't row. We open with a black screen and hear a woman's voice. Booker, she says. Are you afraid of God? No, a man says. But I'm afraid of you. A quote comes up on screen. The mind of the subject will desperately struggle to create memories where none exist. And then we get our location. 1912, the
the coast of Maine. So as a reminder, um, this ex exists in a different universe from Bioshock, from Rapture. You forget about all everything you know about those games. Mm -hmm. There are going to be very fun parallels throughout that I want you to try and draw, and they'll, they'll come up and you'll see them. But it's they're homages. It's this different universe. Don't worry about Rapture. But if this did exist in that same universe, it would be about 50 years before uh, Jack kills Andrew Ryan, mm -hmm. and about 30-ish years before the start of uh, Rapture and it being created. But again, it doesn't matter because they're different universes. We are Booker DeWitt, sitting in a rowboat as it heads towards a distant lighthouse. Of course we are. <laughs> yep. A gentleman rows while a lady sits, admiring the gloom of the ocean. Are you just going to sit there? The gentleman says to the lady. As compared to what? Standing, the lady says. Not standing, rowing. Rowing? I hadn't planned on it. So you expect me to shoulder the burden? The gentleman grunts, tugging on the oars. No, I expect you to do all the rowing, she says. I've made it very clear I don't believe in the exercise. The <laughs> rowing? No, I imagine that's wonderful exercise. The lady hands Booker a wooden box. Engraved in the front are the words, Property of Booker DeWitt, 7th Cavalry, Wounded Knee. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about Wounded Knee, and I'm going to get a bit more in-depth it later on, but we talked about Wounded Knee when we covered Red Dead Redemption. Um, but Wounded Knee was a horrific massacre of a Native American tribe. Um, yeah, we're going to get more into it later, but just to flag that now. Inside the box is a gun, a postcard for somewhere called Monument Island, a photograph of a girl with Elizabeth scratched above her head. On the back of the photograph are the words, Bring to New York Unharmed. I would greatly appreciate it if you'd assist in the rowing, the gentleman grumbles. Perhaps you should ask him, the lady jerks her head at Booker. There's no point in asking, the gentleman says. Why not? Because he doesn't row, the man says. He doesn't row? The woman sounds flabbergasted. No, he says. He doesn't row. Why does this all rhyme? Yep. Ah, the lady leans back. We don't see their faces. They're just covered in, they're wearing these raincoats. She leans back and she says, I see what you mean. So they reach the dock, Booker gets out of the boat, and the two strangers start to row away. And Booker looks after, looks at them, and he speaks in this game, and he says, Hey, is, is someone went to be meeting me here? And the gentleman goes, Well, I certainly hope so. And then the lady adds cheerfully, It seems like a dreadful place to be stranded. And they, <laughs> and they just row off into the distance. Have fun while we strand you. Bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like the most casual stranding ever done. <laughs> So into the lighthouse we go. It's old, rickety, not like the bastion of steel and brass that welcomed us in Bioshock 1. This is an old, timey 1912 lighthouse. On the front door is a note. DeWitt, it says. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. This is your last chance. And it's stained with blood. Dun dun dun. Yeah, this is a much more ominous opening. Inside... I don't know, I feel like plane crash and then going into the spooky metal sphere Fair. in a lighthouse in the middle of the ocean next to your suspiciously next to your plane crash mm -hmm. pretty ominous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this feels more on the nose which i feel like takes away the ominous you're right i don't know why i said that because i even make the point in my critique that this is without with the exception of like this and some violent imagery that's coming up um it's generally a less oppressive opening like, yeah gr granted not this is bad but saying less spoke more mm, okay Ooh. Ooh. poetic <laughs> <laughs> Inside we've the we've got this early morning brain. Those, <laughs> yeah. those bacon rolls woke me you up. You slept well. Inside, angels decorate the walls. An old stitched sign saying, "Of thy sins shall I wash thee." There's a bowl of water in front of it. Booker looks into the bowl. Good luck with that, pal. He says. So up the stairs we go, and we see who is supposed to be meeting us. A man with a bag on his head. Oh. Blood pools underneath him. A sign is nailed to his chest saying, "Don't disappoint us." Higher up the lighthouse, higher and higher and higher and higher, eventually Booker reaches the top floor, where he finds a red metal chair. Definitely not a bathosphere. Not a bathosphere, uh, no. Uh, flies the sphere. Oh, good, yeah. Well, I take back what I said a minute ago. <laughs> it is early, everyone. So, he finds a red metal chair at the very top of the lighthouse. Well, Booker grumbles, looks like they expect me to sit in their fancy chair. <laughs> Look at these guys with their fancy metal chairs. 
<laughs> looks like a cross between like an airplane seat and a barber's chair. It absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. It's getting a haircut. That's a pretty yeah. spot on description of what that chair looks like. So he's like, they expect me to sit in that fancy chair, and that's exactly what he does. But just as his butt touches the seat, whoosh, metal cuffs strap him in, metal casings fold up around him, trapping inside of a large egg like shape. That is definitely not a bathosphere. Make yourself ready, pilgrim, an automated voice says. The bindings are there as a safeguard. Booker tries to struggle, but no, he's trapped. Ascension in the count of five, the voice says. It counts down at an agonizing pace until finally, boom, like a rocket, up we go. 10,000 feet, the voice says. 15,000 feet. Through the clouds we go until we finally burst out into the dreamy blue sky. And we see it, a floating city in the clouds. Hallelujah, the voice says, and shuts off. <laughs> We see Columbia is so much prettier than yes, it Rapture. Is. It, Columbia is it's it's very kind of purposely designed almost to almost feel like a Disney movie when you're walking through it. All the colors are hyper saturated. Everything is very bubbly and and bright and yeah, it's it's a it's a beautifully created city. Um, so yeah, more, more pretty equals more ugly? Question mark. Oh, more pretty heights than dark underbelly better. <laughs> we see a cube, so, except for the fact that they're very. In your fucking face, <laughs> <laughs> the dark underbelly. Well, what I will say is that this was not what rap, uh, what Columbia originally was looking like. Uh, again, you'll see in the art book when when I blend it to you. But initially, it looked like industrial Victorian London almost, like oh. smoky and foggy and grey and grim. And then halfway through production, they basically were like, "No, no, no, Disney. We're doing Disney. That's the plan. We're doing Disney now." Mm. So yeah. So remind me, what is our our political ideology here this time? Not telling you. I'm oh, going to tell you in a bit. Correct. Tell you in a bit. Sounds good. Um, trying to see how Disney aligns. Uh, I would argue Disney does absolutely line up with what they're doing here. Is this so, capitalism? Nope. Are we capitalists now? I mean, we're always getting it. All these it's games, they're capitalists, capitalists, aren't they? We can never escape the yoke of capitalism. <laughs> so, in the distance, uh, as, as the, uh, not the bath sphere, but the, uh, right, the, I don't know what this is called, the, the rocket, the fly is fear, flies down. Um, <laughs> we see a humongous <laughs> statue of an angel in the distance, beckoning us like the Statue of Liberty. Airships cruise through the air. Red, white, and blue flags adorn every single building, all of which seem old, very much in keeping with the 1912 era. The thing about these flags, though, is that they're not the traditional stars and stripes we've come to expect. The stripes are still there, but this time there's just one star. The only thing more prominent than the angel imagery, the airships and the flags, are posters of this man, Father Comstock. Our prophet is written below his white hair and bearded face. Uh, he is our baddie. He's our Andrew Ryan wow, figure. shocking. Yeah. yeah. I never could have guessed that by that Christ-like imagery. <laughs> so the egg ship lands. Oh, I've written, pulled it an egg ship. The egg ship lands, and suddenly we are going down again. Not straight back to Earth, but into the bowels of a building of some kind. Booker catches his breath as we descend past what seems to be scripture. A song, a hymn-like version of the tune Will the Circle Be Unbroken is sung by a choir somewhere nearby. And that's a real song. as a real-life song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken. The scripture reads, Why would he send his saviour unto us if we will not raise a finger for our own salvation? And though we did not deserve his mercy, he has led us to a new Eden, a last chance for redemption. And then the stained glass windows. Oh boy, so much stained glass in this game. So it's a picture of Father Comstock. Giving Mormon. Mm, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 actually, yeah, there's quite a bit of Mormonism in this. Um, so, yep, yeah, the, the stained glass imagery shows Father Comstock leading his flock into the clouds. And above it, it reads, And the prophet shall lead the people to a new Eden. Stepping out of the ship, Booker wanders through the halls of this welcome centre. A shallow pool of water baptises his feet. Candles saturate the screen. And then he sees someone. A blonde man, bathed in white, taking a moment to pray. Excuse me, Booker says. Where am I? And the guy turns and in a deep booming voice goes, Heaven, friend. Or as close as we'll see till judgment day. Booker moves past him. So he seems unbothered by the fact that a new guy's just... Are people coming up here fairly regularly? Um, yeah, I guess so. They, they're the well, this is the welcome center. It's not weird that someone's arrived in the welcome center. They've gone... They've got a weird... If, if, if it's not going to be odd, they've gone a weird route in doing the whole lighthouse route again, where you had a singular flies a sphere mm -hmm. that went up. Because mm -hmm. am I just going to have to go locate my local 
rickety lighthouse that happens to have a splice sphere. Well, it's the same sort of idea where if if you know about it, you know. If you know, you know. If you're in in the group, you know. Sort of idea. And Comstock presumably has maybe sent envoys down to the states to tell people and preach the word, but Columbia is off doing its own thing. Booker moves past the man and decides to keep such questions to himself unless he wants to get made. Clearly, he does not belong here. Working towards the entrance of the Welcome Hub, we see that this city is full of life. Everything seems fine. This isn't Rapture where its best days are behind it. Whatever this place is, it's thriving. A priest stands addressing a small gathering of people in white. And every year, he says, on this day, we recommit ourselves to our fair city, Columbia, and to our prophet, Father Comstock. Lo, if our prophet had just struck down our enemies at Wounded Knee and not railed against the Sodom beneath it, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just railed against the Sodom beneath us but not accepted the three golden gifts of the founders, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just accepted the three golden gifts of the founders and not prayed for our deliverance, it would have been enough. If the prophet had only prayed for our deliverance and not led us to our new Eden, it would have been enough. If Chase, if the prophet had just led us to the new Eden and not purged the vipers of the Orient, it would have been enough. But he's done so much for us. So much. So much. So much. Booker, he's gone above and beyond. He's Yeah, he's done a lot, lot of stuff here. What a champ. Booker pushes through the group. He's not listening. <laughs> and the priest suddenly whirls on him and he goes, Is it someone new? Much like in Bioshock 1, when Jack arrives in the bathosphere and the splicer peers through and he goes, Is it someone new? So again, this is it. They're, 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 there's callbacks, there's little Easter eggs. It's, it's all quite fun. Someone from the Sodom below, he says, newly come to Columbia to be washed clean before our prophet, our founders, and our lord. And Booker's like, I just need passage into the city. But the priest is like, Brother, the only way into Columbia is through rebirth in the sweet waters of baptism. And so Booker's like, okay. Ugh, fine, do your stupid baptism bullshit. And the priest takes his hand, lowers him into the water, and he holds him there. <laughs> and he holds him there. Drown. And he holds him there. Up Booker comes, spluttering and gasping for air. I don't know, brothers and sisters, the priest says, and a small smile creeps across his face, and he goes, but this one doesn't look clean to me. Back under the water, Booker goes, and the priest holds him there, and holds him there, and holds him there, and then everything goes dark. Booker's not very strong if a old, blind priest can overpower him. That's a... That's not a bad point. Uh, yeah. I don't know what his blindness has to do with his strength. I mean... Maybe, maybe dude lifts, you know? <laughs> You're right. I'm, I'm sorry for my ignorance. <laughs> we awaken in Booker's office back in New York City. Gambling tickets, bottles of adult juice, cigarettes, they all sit absently on his desk. Someone... An old timey gun. Yes, someone is banging on the door. Who's there? Booker mumbles. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt! A male voice yells from behind the front door. We had a deal, do it! Open this door! I told you, Booker barks back. I'm not gonna do it! Go away! But the banging continues, getting louder and louder, and eventually Booker opens the door. New York City covered in fire, ash, smoke, and explosions. Airships hang overhead, raining down missiles from above. Is that Columbia just casually sitting there in the sky? Maybe. Kind of looks like Monument Island there. Maybe. Booker gasps as a missile fires towards him, and then he wakes up. Back in Columbia, vomiting water. Three statues stand over him, Columbia's three founders. Father Washington, Father Jefferson, and Father Franklin. Oh, I forgot about that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Washington, get, Washington is looking yoked. Yes. Um. They are all looking very buff. Just like real life. Yeah, probably. This is the political philosophy we're looking at with Colombia. Um, patriotism, nationalism, mm. you know, American, uh, historical revision. It kind of covers too much, to be frank. It does historical revisionism, patriotism, nationalism, religious patriotism, which is a separate thing. Right, Imperialism, racism, obviously, which so just connects to all of it. It does America. <laughs> Basically, you could just boil it down to it's doing America. Political yeah. philosophy... America. <laughs> a, it's, it is a, it is a car, Columbia is a cartoon of America. Like, even though we joke and stuff, this is a cartoon of America. This ain't representative. Father Washington, Father Jefferson, and Father Franklin hold out their three golden gifts to the people. Jefferson's scroll for laws, Washington's sword for power, and Franklin's key for knowledge. Devotees kneel at the feet of these statues, thanking them for gracing Secession Day with beautiful weather. This is what today is, Secession Day, whatever that is. One of them, praying, recites scripture, and he says, 
Our prophet fills our lungs with water, so we better love the air.、Mm. Which you know is just bad things happen, so you can find love, etc. Is yeah horrible. That's why they drown you when you get there. Twenty thousand feet in the air, this game can't get away from water.、Ah. Yeah. Another is like the seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. And Booker is looks around and he like squints and he goes, just because a city flies doesn't mean it's not got its own fair share of fools. That idiot priest needs to learn the difference between baptizing a man and drowning one. I've got a girl to find. So he heads into the city proper. So as I said before, a lot of influence for Columbia's design was Disneyland. We see railings over the city carrying cargo between each flying district, almost like watching、um, the way that this is framed. When you see it, it's almost like a roller coaster going by.、Um, there's there's mascots, there's everything. So all the colors pop in the background of a stunning image of Va- Father Zachary Comstock, the founder of the city. It's Secession Day, and we learn through various posters, collectibles, and background chatter that this is the anniversary of the day Columbia flew into the sky and officially abandoned the United States of America. So Columbia is not a part of the USA in this world. A parade tells us a little more. We see a young Comstock toiling on his farm, visited by the great angel Columbia, giving him a vision of a great city. That familiar image of Comstock leading his flock into the clouds and out of the Sodom below. And then this image of Comstock and his wife holding a baby girl. A miracle child、That's、is born. Definitely not Elizabeth. Why would it ever not be them? A miracle child is born. A parade narrator says, "The Lamb, she who is the future of our city." So again, the Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing parallels. Yeah. Not gonna lie,、mm-hmm. I feel like all of Bioshock Two's philosophy would have fit better here.、Uh, no, no, Comstock wouldn't be a collectivist. Not in a million years. No. No,、um, they're doing something very different with Comstock.、Um, Fair enough. So, and there's there's a fun.、Uh, I will get there when, once we finish this game. I will tell you about a heavily rumored、um, alternate ending, which sounds awful. <laughs> um, but we'll get to it when we get to it.、Uh, so yes, so the lamb, she is the future of our city. We hear chatter that there's going to be an annual raffle, and everyone in the city is really excited for it, hoping they would win. We're <laughs> gonna and, raffle off the child. We sure, yeah.、Uh, what's the prize of the raffle? Hmm, is it the child? Who knows? But Booker doesn't have long to think about that because suddenly a plucky little street rat grabs him. Telegram for you, Mister Dewitt. He says, handing Booker a card. How do you know who I am? Good question. So he takes the telegram and it reads, "Do it. Stop. Do not alert Comstock to your presence. Stop. Whatever you do, do not pick number seventy-seven. Stop. It's unsigned. We don't know who sent it. There's even a fair for us to dick around him. Isn't that nice? And it's here we get our superpowers. So a mustachioed man in a top hat stands on a stage and he goes, "What would you say if I told you a man could shoot lightning from his fingers? If I told you a man could hoist a one-ton stallion straight into the air? Would you believe me? Well, friends, those are no flights of fancy. Those are vigors I'm talking about. Brought to you courtesy of Mr. Jeremiah Fink himself.、Uh, remember the name Fink, where he's going to become important. So vigors he are are. Su Chong of this game. He is our. I'll tell you、so、right now. He is our Su Chong. So、yeah. we were doing. They were doing. Obviously, vigors aren't uh, uh, exactly, but they pretty much are. They're basically、um, basically plasmids. plasmids.、Yeah. So they were doing it like thirty years before、uh, Rapture had it cracked, or twenty years at least, maybe. Yes, but again, different universes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just on a time scale, nineteen eleven is impressive to.、Uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah.、Um, so they they work exactly the same way our pl- plasmids do as far as gameplay is concerned. We can shoot lightning, fire, all that good stuff.、Uh, each of the vigors have different names. So for example,、uh, there's a fr- there's freeze bla- winter blast in Bioshock. In this, it's called Old Man Winter.、Um, we get some unique ones.、Uh, for example,、uh, you don't shoot bees from your hands. You now shoot crows. It's called Murder of Crows. Uh, it's the, That's best, the one. best one. It is the、Very、best one、cool. because、yeah. you get an upgrade later if you if you buy it.、Um, where what you can do is you can set basically turn bodies into nests. So when someone a dead body lies there and someone runs over that body, it bursts and the crows attack them from each body. And there are points where you can、it. you can spam that. So、yeah. there's points where I just like littered a room with bodies and then just stood and watched as hordes came in and just died over and over. You、right. sociopath.、Uh, yes. Yeah.、Uh, so anyway, so vigors work exactly the same way as plasmids.、Um, we're not going to hang around the fair for too long, but there are a couple of things I want to point out. We hear about the cigarettes sold in Colombia. They're called Minor Victory, and they're marketed exclusively. Ex- nobody else is like no one else is for these towards kids. 
Well, so Rapture marketed his cigarettes towards pregnant women. This markets it towards kids. Uh, there are stands and carnival games, all with a religious tint, like Keep the Devil Out, where you shoot someone dressed as the devil to save a porterly white woman and her baby. There are statues and balloons with mm -hmm. George Washington's face on them. So, yeah, big old fair. Um, there's shooting galleries where you blast at a vicious and mysterious gang called the Vox Populi and their menacing leader, Daisy Fitzroy. Ooh, ooh, there are baddies, I guess. Then there's this, an exhibit showing off a mechanical creature. Come on down and see the amazing handyman. Is he man? Is he machine? Only Colombian ingenuity could create such an amazing marvel. Or just retreading all the same ground of your prior game. Yeah, this is obviously uh, reminiscent a little bit of Big Daddy stuff. A little bit. Um, yeah. Just a smidge. Just a smidge. Uh, but yeah, a bald man has been merged into a mechanical suit. A photographer takes his picture, but every time the flash goes off, the handyman winces, holding his hands up in fear. Like, he doesn't look angry or aggressive or strong. He looks scared and really sad. So anyway, next. There's uh, my favorite moment. A lot of people's kind of little highlight of this whole sequence. The barbershop quartet. <laughs> crooning a familiar song, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, not the Bee Gees, as I said in yeah. my critique. It, the more I think about this, everybody has their own blind spots. I clearly have a music blind spot. <laughs> I got Kasabi and Amuse mixed yeah. up. I got Bee Gees and Beach Boys mixed up. I got, when we covered Bioshock 1, I said the song was Under the Sea, not um, Beyond the Sea. <laughs> like, it just keeps... Yeah. I don't know why I have this weird blind spot. Anyway. I remember this moment specifically in 2013. Um, I just standing there and, and watching them uh, croon away. It was... Weirdly, mm. this is the one part of the fair I don't remember. <laughs> That's interesting. I so, remember every other part of this fair, especially the part about to come up. Um, I will tell you um, that this stuff pops up a lot throughout the game. It's really interesting because huh. obviously this is 1912. Why the... F is there a BG, uh, 60s, Beach so Boys 60s, song? 60s, yeah. yeah. And there's we get covers like like honky tonk covers of like Bowie songs later and stuff. Amazing. So all songs that you know seem to have been re-engineered for 1912. Listen, Bowie songs were being played in the medieval era, as we learned in the movie A Knight's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly, Comstock is a time traveler. Ever. The sign behind the quartet reads Columbia's gayest quartet, presented to you by Mr. Albert Fink. It's cute. Nice. Yeah. We see a couple of You go, boy. Students. You <laughs> go. And Just they were dancing. bandmates. Yeah. It's <laughs> always a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a lovely day. What could possibly go wrong? And then Booker sees an odd poster. A painting of a black demonic hand. The letters A-D carved into the back of it. The words say, You shall know the false shepherd by his mark. Oh no, Booker's gonna have that mark, isn't he? Shit, Booker breathes and holds up his own hand. <laughs> <laughs> we see the letters A-D are carved into it. The fuck does he have that carved into his hand? I, don't, I mean, I don't know about either of you, but what would you do in this situation? You've walked into a weird looking Buy city. Buy some gloves. Buy some gloves. Tear off a bit of your top and maybe wrap it round. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, at that point, cut off my head. Well... Cut off your hand. Start at gloves. <laughs> the top Start at gloves. The top, I don't, I feel like if an entire city is going to come after me thinking that I am the devil, shaved off a bit of skin on my hand <laughs> yeah. is, you know, feels like that's, a much lesser. That's my gun hand. <laughs> okay, but he needs to show the hand in order to get gloves. I, I, what if he goes up to the glove maker? Like, what if he goes up to the glove maker? They're like, well, let's get you a fine pair of gloves. Let me see your hands so we can measure them. Oh, no, he's got the sign of the beast. <laughs> 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 How often is it are your hands being sort of checked? I, uh, Assumedly by a bespoke glove maker. <laughs> I, uh, I'll buy something off the rack. Um, <laughs> that poster there, mm. um, the art style is really kind of reminiscent of World War II propaganda. Often, yes. often the kind of very racist caricature um, uh, World War II. Obviously, in this case, it's not racist, but the the art style is really uh, it, it is really sort of accurate. I think it's very creepy. Booker decides be not to do anything at all about the fact he's got this AD mark on the back of his hand, um, and he continues on. But suddenly, he's interrupted by these two goobers, a man who he shows the back of his hand. Yes, he does. Yeah, morons. So. A man and a woman. The man is wearing a blackboard with heads and tails on it. It seems like heads is winning. Heads? The man asks. Or tails? The woman asks. Come on, Booker says. Just, just let me through. And the man, the man repeats firmly. Heads? Or tails? The woman says. 
Booker sighs and flips the coin. Tails, he says, but it lands on heads. Told you, the man says to the woman. I never find that as satisfying as I imagined. Chin up, the woman says sternly. There's always next time. As they turn to walk away, we see that even the back of the blackboard is covered in tally marks for heads. It seems that every single time the coin has been flipped, it's landed on heads. Anyway, off to the raffle. So it is heaving. So busy that Booker can't get to the other side of the park it's being held in. A man in a top hat, Jeremiah Fink, our inventor of Vigors, oh, is Columbia's greatest inventor. I remember what they're raffling. He leads the crowd in song. They're singing just like, Oh, Columbia, we love you, and all that sort of shit. No, we don't love you. A girl with a basket slowly walks by, handing out baseballs with numbers on them. Sorry, Booker says to the girl, no sale. So he's going to pick 77, right? She chuckles and says, silly, there's never a charge for the raffle. Booker shrugs and goes uh, and pulls a ball out of the basket. It's number 77. <laughs> <laughs> Again, showing the back of his devil hand to the girl. Yeah, that's a good point. No one. He's to, so yeah. stupid. Yeah, very thick. He is, he is as dumb. He's dumber than John Marston. Oh, by far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, why he never gets himself a nice wolf to settle down with. Yeah. <laughs> I go to the Red Dead episode, everyone. <laughs> so some time passes and eventually the raffle begins. The basket girl brings a ball onto stage for Fink, so the adventure of the plasmids, he's leading it, to pull a number from, and everybody cheers and whoops and hollers almost aggressively. People are so excited for whatever this is, they're drooling. Is that not the prettiest young white girl in all of Columbia? Fink chuckles. All right then, the winner is... Number 77, come and claim your prize. The curtain behind Fink raises, and we see the prize. You get the first throw, Fink winks at Booker. The crowd tunelessly sing a wedding song as a white man and a black woman are pushed onto the stage. They're chained up. And I will point out a couple of things on this. Number one... The cartoons obviously are horrific. Yeah, they're sort of they're sort of uh, presented in this uh, sort of diorama of a jungle. This mm. sort of uh, wooden cutout of a jungle, and uh, there are cartoon monkeys with uh, the stereotypical features we'd expect of racist cartoons at the time. Um, there is, a, I've not got a picture of this, but in the you, you see behind the stage later, and there are cages, they were kept in cages, uh, with these cartoons around it, and I just want to flag that there is a very, very famous, one of the OG long-form video essayists on YouTube, um, who I'm not going to name, who made a critique of Bioshock Infinite, and who moaned that the game didn't take its racism seriously, and... The way that he moaned about it was by saying that nobody says the N-word in Bioshock Infinite and everybody should be saying the N-word at all times because they're so racist. That's a very, that's a very Tarantino thing. And here's the there. really important bit. While he's saying that, this, this criticism goes on for about 10 minutes. He is saying the N-word. He is a white man. Saying what? the N-word numerous times in that video. What? He's like, nobody says constantly. Um, and that video was still on YouTube and it is still monetized. So... Mm. But yeah, uh, real. it's not a great, very good criticism because I would argue, what, what more do you need this game to say? Like, this is awful. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on. Uh, so things like, you get the first throw to Booker. That's what he's won. He's won the first throw. They're about to stone them with baseball. Throw it at Fink. Uh, and get him fucked. The woman's like, please don't do this. The man says, don't hurt her, please. It was all me, it was all me. Please, what are you doing? And then Fink waves at Booker and goes, come on, boy. Are you gonna throw it? Or are you taking your coffee black these days? So this is the part of the game where the player is expected to make a choice. Why would you ever choose one of these two paths? You get a choice, which is uh, throw the ball or don't throw the ball. Are you a horrid racist person? <laughs> Or a sane human being. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, <laughs> these days, that's not uh, for a lot of people, unfortunately, as simple an answer as it should be. Now, I'd like to preface this. I, I think it would be fair to say that Chase and I would uh, immediately agree on which choice to make here. However, mm. I, are you giving us choice? I you do. get choices in this game. This I is do. your first choice. Throw the baseball at Fink. No, your choice. No, uh, that'd be really cool if that was the choice. The choice is throw the ball at the couple or don't throw the ball at all. <laughs> It'd be really cool there if that so was one of the choices. There. there are hundreds of options yeah. here. I, but I would like to just say when it comes to the choices, unless there, unless we come across I strictly don't remember, mm. in my head I think I remember all the choices. So yeah. I might bow out of choice 
noise making and leave that to my esteemed colleague. Yeah, totally fair. Uh, Chase, it's your call. Oh, don't throw the fucking ball. Okay, don't what? be a racist. Cool. Shocker. Shocker. I wonder why you would ever yeah. not... Yeah. Hot take. Yeah. Hot take, I know. So, uh, be racist, kids. Booker does not throw the ball. Uh, so he looks at the couple, looks at Fink, and then growls, well, I got something for you, you son of a bitch. He pulls his arm back, planning to throw the baseball at Jeremiah Fink. Yeah! But a guard grabs his hand. It's him! The guard barks. He looks Somebody at- Somebody finally fucking yeah. saw the back of it. <laughs> finally saw the AD on the back of his hand. I feel like at that point, I'd like keep the AD hand in my pocket and just like try to be left-handed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Fink uh, looks at Booker's hand. The whole crowd kind of pause and stare. And he goes, now, where'd you get that brand, boy? Don't you know that makes you the backstabbing snake in the grass, false shepherd? And we ain't letting no false shepherd into our flock. Show them what we got planned, boys. A guard holds up a gizmo that looks like a gun, but at the end of it has it's whirling- It's a thingamabob. It's a thingamabob. It has whirling metal spikes at the end of it. This is called a skyhook. He pushes it close to Booker's face. Time slows. Booker grabs the guard holding him. The metal spikes come close to Booker's face. Booker grabs the guard holding him and mashes his face into the sky hook. Blood, skull, and brain go everywhere. Wait, he just grabbed a random guy? There are two guards. Oh, okay, okay, okay. One guard's got him grabbed, the other one has a sky hook. He's got the one that's grabbed him and he's smashed his face into the sky hook. That's cool, that's fine. The crowd scream, run away, and cue combat. So this is where gameplay officially begins. We fight through Columbia, trying to make it to Monument Island where this girl, Elizabeth, is waiting for us. We get new powers, enjoy the scenery, pick up some audio dialogue. Enjoy the scenery. <laughs> I mean, it's still pretty. We, we just saw that and we're gonna I still think, go on holiday. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think when you find out what a city is built on in like immediately before you got there, you might be like, uh, holiday over, I'll just hide yeah. from the people chasing me. Fair. Um, but no, Booker, and I want to point this out, Booker goes on a murderous rampage. He kills everybody. Like, everybody, every, no, not everybody as in, he kills everybody that he can see. What a good false shepherd. He's just shooting as he goes, He's because they're all trying to kill him, he's trying to get there. I, I'm already on the train of, uh, you know, we talked about Rapture's a Lost Cause. Mm. I'm already on the train for this, I'm like, I've got a boat, I've got a ship leaving, sky ship, yeah. anyone who wants to come can come, and then we are sick, we're dropping this bitch to the floor. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. So so I'm not going to kind of waste too much time with all the combat gameplay stuff. We, we, we fight through, we're on our way to Monument Island. But there is one thing I want to show you before we finish up this part. This is the Fraternal Order of the Raven. It's a huge mansion with a chapel in the centre. Booker needs to pass through this to get to where he's going. A group dressed like the Ku Klux Klan, but wearing black instead of white, are gathered for service. The priest leading this congregation... It's so subtle. Yes. The priest leading this congregation stands on a platform with the words protecting our race engraved on it. Behind him is a mural. The mural shows George Washington holding a copy of the Constitution in his hand. For God and country, it says... It is our holy duty to guard against the foreign hordes. We see stereotypical drawings of indigenous peoples, Irish people, Mexican people, anyone who isn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant has been demonized in this image. We've reached, not quite reached the point of parody where it doesn't make sense, where America may have been built uh, by immigrants, but it was its laws and constitution were made by and for white people. Okay, um, here's where I'm going to disagree with both of you. I don't think Bioshock Infinite is on the nose. Bioshock. Bioshock. I don't think Bioshock Infinite is on the nose. I think Bioshock Infinite is, to be frank, a pretty solid representation of America as a Scotsman as the way that the world looks in America today. The KKK openly recruiting and nobody doing anything. How does that disagree with what I've said? Well, you said that it was a bit too on the nose. No, I said we've not re yet reached the point where it was on the nose. Fun fact, the National Liberty Foundation, a, a real life Tea Party-esque political group that is based in Florida, has used this Florida. image in wow. their propaganda from Bioshock Infinite. This, they have taken this from the game and they have promoted this as part of their political propaganda. Sorry, what? Yes. Excuse me? The irony of the group you described, who I'm lucky that I haven't heard of up to this point, using this imagery, parodying uh, the racism inherent in the foundation of America and not realizing or not caring yes. is frightening. And here's the thing, it's interesting to me this, because you were asking about the political philosophy chase. I think the one thing that Bioshock Infinite gets right is um, its embracement of this concept of worshipping the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Like, it's, I mean, it was described as political scripture by John Adams. Uh, was it John Adams? 
I don't know. One of the founding fathers I described the Constitution as political scripture. I absolutely know people in real life who would agree with that. As in, the way it is right now is perfect and it must never be changed, uh, etc. Yeah, and there are amendments. Yeah, those are the but, same people who uh, their favorite bits are literally called amendments, yeah, um, which is... Yeah. Always hilarious. Uh, but so, so again, that's one of the things I think it gets right. Like we literally, our first introduction to Bioshock Infinite is people praying to George Washington and thanking him for the Constitution, which is treated as a Bible. Um, it's a bastardized version of the Constitution. I want to be very clear about that. We're going to see bits of it later, but yeah. Uh, so you see something else inside the, the the KKK house, the Fraternal Order of the Raven, um, which is some artwork that shows what Colombians think of Abraham Lincoln. Wow. <laughs> Obviously best known for the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. Uh, do either of you want to describe this? Um, we've got uh, the, uh, an image of the assassination of Lincoln mm. in which Lincoln is sat there um, at his booth <laughs> at his booth, haha <laughs> um, in, in, his, in his little theater box sat, he's got devil horns and glowing red eyes and he's looking back on uh, John Wilkes Booth who's about to shoot him um, who's bathed in radiant holy like a, light like a halo he's got a halo yeah. yeah saint wilkes booth yeah it's fun um so there's stuff like this up everywhere inside the fraternal order of the raven like the artwork is it's funny like this is this is really fun like i like this stuff um, i feel like yeah. this is one of those things where if i worked in the game i'd mm. be like i'll draw it i don't want my name in the credits but i'll draw it <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so we learn while we're here that Colombia's racism and hatred is arguably even deeper than the sort of racism and hatred, we hatred we've learned about in our history books. Colombians don't keep personal slaves. Not because they think slavery is bad, they think it's very good, but because they literally do not want to see minorities in the residential and commercial districts. Like, so it's like, not even as a slave are you allowed here. And just for the avoidance of doubt, Comstock, who we haven't met yet, is an active racist as well. We shocker. Yeah. The leader of the racist island is a racist. I never could have guessed. That. Well, it's like you know, if if the fraternal order of the Raven appeared in uh, in Rapture, Andrew Ryan wouldn't be in favor of them because he wasn't a racist. Uh, he was a lot of things, but he wasn't a racist. I mean, it's yeah, no, he was. Uh, whether whether or not you like. Um, are like writing racist books or making racist art or making racist statements. I think when he built a society that didn't allow for black people to, uh, or people of any color other than white to live comfortably in normal circumstance, um, whether unintentional, whether whether unintentionally or not, we talked about how it was commonplace oh. for people to change their skin color right, and like yeah. so like he may not have been uh, uh, a sort of religion. He, uh, he wasn't he wasn't a racist preacher, but he is solely responsible for a society that mm. uh, was yeah, right. entirely weighted towards white, which is a far more uh, realistic form of. I, I don't know about that because look at Bioshock 2 and look at Minerva's Den and look at Cole Porter who was one of the most powerful men in the city and an, accept, and an exception you literally said he was he was like the only person yeah, at, that, yeah. at that echelon who was black and people were saying why are you not having the, the I mean it's one of those if you're not directly racist but you're also not stopping the racists yeah. Or calling out the racists. As you are in charge of the city. And you were in charge of the city. Well, yeah. well bear in mind that, so, so, Andrew Ryan, he, he invited people to the, I don't want to defend Andrew Ryan because yeah, he's evil, a right? Weird, weird, uh, no, no, it's just, I just think it's useful to, to flag that, like, so Andrew Ryan invited the world's greatest to rapture. And as a result of the time period, like, he, he, he sought out people that were famous and well known for their works. So, at the time, not many black people were known for their brilliance or for their works. So he just kind of went like, "Oh, I like you lot," because this he, is like he's a, a he's a fantasy white fantasy world man. No, if you if you didn't if you didn't want to if you, if you if you wanted, you could have just said, "Oh yeah, in this world, absolutely." Of course, he would have known who the the black mathematicians are. Also, there absolutely work. were. They were just getting covered up by the white people. Yeah. Well, no, but that's what I mean though, because of the circles he. Ran, it's a fantasy. It's, it's a fantasy world. world. Just make it like. Yeah, I feel like we should move on. <laughs> yeah, no, fine. Yeah, I, I don't want to come across as an Andrew Ryan protector, but it was just worth me noting that, it, look, in comparison to Comstock, all right, Comstock is, like, ultra-racist. Yeah, this is his, it, Neither it, of us disagree with that. So He's a, a grand wizard. We get a, a audio log where he explains more. As a boy, I had a dog named Bill. Like all dogs, Bill was a loyal friend. If we had not fed him, Bill would have been loyal. If we had struck him, Bill would have been loyal. Only when the colored man can make that claim... Well, he take his place in society. 
So you get the idea of what he believed. Anyway, the Order of the Raven has also been uh, torturing people in here. So naturally, Booker kicks some ass, kills them all, bang, 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 bang. Good. Uh, making it out of the building. We like Booker. Yeah. Uh, making it out of the building, covered in the blood of racists, Booker sees that the airship that should be taking him to Monument Island is decommissioned. The Welcome Island is on lockdown because of his murderous rampage. <laughs> but luckily, he has his skyhook. So he leaps into the air, hooks it onto one of these cargo railings we saw at the beginning, and rides the railing over to the island. Unfortunately, it doesn't take him as far as he needs to go. So you can literally ride these almost like roller coasters. You can turn around in midair. It's very you can fun. jump. You can like jump from one to another. Combat happens with these in the area, so you can like sort of oh, fly around cool. shooting people. It's, it was a lot of fun. I remember when it came out. Um, but yes, but he doesn't get where he needs to go. Um, so suddenly he's interrupted by a huge grey airship blocking his path. He dismounts on the airship, goes inside, and it's here we finally get to meet Father Zachary Comstock. I know why you've come, false shepherd, Comstock says. I see every sin that blackens your soul. Wounded knee. The Pinkertons. The drinking. Again? They're back? Booker was a Pinkerton. Go and, go and listen to no! Go and listen to the Red Dead episodes. The drinking. But now we need to hate Booker. The Pinkertons, the drinking and gambling, and of course, Anna. And now to repay a debt, you've come for my lamb. But not all debts can be repaid, Booker. And Booker's like, you don't know me, pal. And Comstock goes, prophecy is my business, do it. Just as blood is yours. Oh, so he, he explicitly knows... Do it story. He knows Do it story. He claims he is a prophet. Whether that's true or not, maybe does he get visions? Who knows? Um, but right now, he definitely know. knows enough. I feel like there's probably a plasma, or excuse me, a vicar that could do that. Do you know why these men would die for me? A group of guards enter, and he goes, Because I have seen their future in the glory, and hence they are content. What brought you to Columbia, Booker? Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. This will end in blood. Then again, it always does with you, doesn't it? It always ends in blood. The Lord forgives everything, but I'm just a prophet, so I don't have to. Amen! And then behind us, we hear a woman go, Amen! Booker turns, and a nun, dressed all in white, stands there, holding a Molotov cocktail in her <laughs> hand. She drops it on her head, it breaks, and she is doused in fire. The fire spreads, and the airship starts to explode. Wow. Booker is thrown from the front of it. He catches the sky rail with his hook and rides it on to Monument Island. So we learn, before I get to part two, I just want to flag this because this isn't massively relevant, but I think it's a good example of how the game kind of mishandles its own themes. Um, we learn through collectibles and inferences. Booker DeWitt, um, Booker DeWitt's mother was Native American. Okay. Does Booker DeWitt look Native American to you? No. <laughs> no. Booker DeWitt looks white as I do. Um, so yeah, just, just again, it's not relevant. It never comes up. It's just, I feel like you could do something with that. Yeah, like, it, makes, yeah. It, makes the, it makes the, we'll get onto it more later, but it makes the involvement in Wounded Knee uh, yes, it does. even more disturbing if that's possible. Part two, Elizabeth. Grand. When Booker gets to Monument Island, he sees that it's abandoned. Signs with danger, caution, warning on them scream at us as we approach the huge statue of the Angel Columbia. The statue, it seems, has been hollowed out. Inside is a research centre. We see operating rooms, blackboards with equations and formulas written on them. This all seems to be here to document the growth of a young girl. Booker's like, what did they do to her? Gotta find her. Fast. Inside, there's an audio log by the brilliant scientist Rosalind Lutess, art by Synthamon Sugar. Pretty. Yes, uh, the Lutesses are, uh, Lutess is a, a fan favorite. People love the Lutesses, um, and here's her. The Lutesses, are there multiple? So I keep saying that, the, the, people love Lutess, people love Lutess. So uh, where, where do you recognize Lutess from? Do you recognize her from anywhere? My mind too. Is she in Bioshock? I'm not going to say anything. Um, so inside, there's an audio log by the brilliant scientist Rosalind Lutess, and the, the audio log reads, What makes the girl different? That's think. your lamb voice. Is she related to lamb? Not related. To that. that is my lamb voice. No, it, <laughs> I, 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 what I will say is I have used that voice already today. There was a, there was a brief <laughs> second when I saw her, and I'm like, I guess she kind of ish looks like lamb, I guess. And then you did the voice, and I'm like, 
wait, was I actually onto something? I will point out actually that Lamb, so Lamb does have that soft, almost like therapy-like voice. No, uh, Lutes has a bit more of a stern, assertive voice, where it's more like, I can't, probably can't do it, but it's like, what makes the girl different? I suspect it has less to do with what she is, and rather more with what she is not. A small part of her remains from where she came. It would seem the universe does not like its peas mixed in with its porridge. She's halfway between Lamb and Tenenbaum. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, um, Lutes is that you'll find out more about Lutes later. So, Lutes is the reason Columbia flies. Oh. She, she, dis- she is the chief scientist. She is the Tenenbaum of this world. If, if Fink is the Suchong, she is the Tenenbaum, in a sense. Um, so, she discovered some amazing. Can yeah. you just not know how to make an original game? I mean, no, it's, it's more just like brilliant scientist brings science to, to this world. It just so, feels like there's a lot of one to one parallels. Mm-hmm. Lutes discovered some amazing anti-gravity atoms that keep Columbia levitating. It's not helium and hot air. It's a much more advanced science. And it seems that Lutes has been charged with studying Elizabeth. It's not long before Booker finds Elizabeth. So through a one-way window, we get our first look at her. A beautiful young woman with raven black hair pulled back in a ponytail. She's surrounded by pictures of Paris, postcards, posters, photographs, paintings. I make the argument in my critique with the Disneyfication of it all. Which Disney princess do you think Elizabeth looks like? Belle. Yes. yes. Especially uh, with the Paris. Absolutely. With the with the, the French angle, with the blue skirt, with the white top. Uh, I think she's purposely been made to look like Belle. We do know that Ken Levine did want to make her Disney-fica- Disney-fied. I mean, he, he succeeded. Yeah, she's got big like saucer eyes, stuff like that. So anyway. We see Elizabeth throw what she can't see us. Booker approaches the the glass, um, and, and Elizabeth can't see him. It's one way. We see her take a deep breath, look at a painting of the Eiffel Tower, and uh, she tears a hole in reality. Anyway, uh, we Elizabeth, see cinema. It's, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, it's it's not great. It's not worth it. I've been there. It's fine. Also, this now just feels like the live action movie, Bell. <laughs> Yeah, I really feel like you're skipping over the fact that Elizabeth has just tore a hole in reality to go to Paris. <laughs> can you can you describe the Parisian scene opened in the portal there, Chase? Uh, the, the Eiffel Tower is there. Can you see? I would like to say that this is uh, illegal because you cannot take photos of the Eiffel Tower at night, and this is clearly the Eiffel Tower at night. Illegal photo. Get it off my screen. But can you <laughs> can you can can you point out what's playing at the cinema? Mm. Uh. Revenge of the Jedi? Yes, which was the alternate name for Return of the Jedi. It was the original name I that was, Lucas was going to use. I was about to say where I'm like, that's what I think it says. I'm I, I'm not a Star Wars fan. So I'm, like, I'm 99% sure that that is not a So Star are we Wars to take movie? that this is 1980 Paris? Uh, not, to yeah. be fair, we've... No, because we already have songs from the future here. Okay. Mm. Unless she's a time traveler, who knows? No, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, good point, but... Remind me what... She no, tore it... a hole in reality, yes. and we're really just embracing this. My love, my love. <laughs> it's Bioshock. This doesn't fucking phase me at this point. We've seen Wackier. Okay. We've seen Wackier. I'm mainly on the fact that this game came out several years prior to live-action Disney Bell, who mm. also could tear holes into reality to see the Eiffel Tower. Kind of. I really like the live action one. Um, I'm I'm like so, one of the few people uh, in the world. So do I. Yeah, <laughs> so I really like it. I feel like I defend most live action musicals, yeah. which is shocking being Although, a theater kid. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What we do is, uh, so yeah. she op- she opens a tear into reality. She looks in and we see Paris. Uh, La Revanche du Jedi or The Revenge of the Jedi is playing. We hear Everybody Wants to Rule the World, the Bowie song playing off in the distance. And um, so it seems like she's opened like a window into this world. She doesn't step through the portal. Either she's scared or she can't. It's taking all of her power and effort just to keep the window open, but yeah, freaky shit. And Booker is like, Jesus Christ, well, whatever that was, got nothing to do with the job at hand, and he keeps journeying through the facility. He's like, whatever, who cares? Yeah, we'll the girl I need to capture, got nothing to do with me. Yeah, Bye. we'll bookmark that one. We'll come back to it. So um, he eventually makes it to a humongous library at the top of the angel statue, continuing on with our bell. Why does he not try to break through the window? Well, he doesn't want to scare her. It's his quarry! Break through the window! So he gets to a library, much like Beauty and the Beast, um, at the top of the angel statue, and he sees Elizabeth, um, and he steps in and he goes, Uh, hello? And she freaks out. She starts throwing books at him. She clock, <laughs> <laughs> she clocks him in the side of the head. Um, eventually, she picks up a heavy, hardbound book and raises it above her head. Who are you? And he goes, my name's DeWitt. I'm here to get you out of, but she doesn't listen. She swings the book at his head. Booker blocks it. There's a beat as the two look at each other. And then Elizabeth's expression softens. And she says, are you real? 
I'm real enough, Booker replies. She missing a pinky? As she, she, is. she is, yes. Pinky. Suddenly, a metal mechanical statue of Father Comstock lights up. We hear a tune whistle out of it, presumably Columbia's national anthem. He's coming, Elizabeth gasps. You, you gotta go. You don't want to be here when he comes here. She's interrupted by a heavy mechanical shriek from somewhere up above. Just a minute, she shouts at the, at the sound. I'm, I'm getting dressed. The mechanical shriek screams back at her, but Elizabeth stands her ground and she goes, Stop it. You're, you're too impatient. That's enough. But boom, whatever the shriek is, does not like being told no. It starts to try and tear into the facility from the outside. Booker and Elizabeth decide they'll talk about what's going on later and try to make their escape racing out of the Is building. It? Please tell me hmm? a giant mechanical bald eagle. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. That's a yes! <laughs> Let's go, baby! Why do you think it's a giant mechanical bald eagle? That's come very much out Amer of nowhere. America. Because it's America. Just because America. Metal okay. screeching, which is very hmm? eagle. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming from the sky, and we'll it's now trying to tear in with its talons. We'll put a pin in it. So the, the Booker and Elizabeth are like, we'll talk about what is happening here later, let's get out of here. So they, they start running away together. Um, Elizabeth, as they pass, she sees the one-way windows as we go, and she's like, What's this? They were watching me? All this time? Why did they put me here? What am I? What am I? She asks as she opens another portal to 1980s Paris. Uh, Booker just kind of like pushes her on ahead and he just goes, You're the girl who's getting out of this tower! And he rushes behind her. And that's when they're interrupted by the mechanical shrieking thing. You can't see it very well. This is an eye. I, there's no good picture of it here. But this is Songbird. A humongous oh. mechanical bird. Yeah! I'm so good at this. It's not an eagle, but it is. It's it's beaks like a, like curved like a um, like an eagle. No, like a non carnivorous bird. It's like uh, even though it's definitely is very very scary. I'm into it. You'll get better looks at it later. I'm on. so good at this. Uh, so yeah, so this is Songbird. Uh, it's a massive bird. It tries to tear into the facility with massive metal claws, squealing while it does. But Booker and Elizabeth eventually make it outside to the very top of the tower. They don't get a second to catch their breath. Songbird thrashes and throws itself into the tower, <laughs> knocking the two of them into the air. And suddenly, they're falling through the sky. And that's another bit of Songbird there. That's its head, that's its wing. Booker grabs Elizabeth, readies his skyhook, and latches onto a rail. It looks like they've gotten away, but Monument Island is breaking apart in front of them, and a piece of rubble smashes into the sky rail, breaking it in two. They fall, and they fall into water. Booker falls unconscious and comes to on a beach. Elizabeth is giving him CPR. He vomits up some water and passes out. Again. <laughs> some more time passes, and he eventually regains consciousness again, and he goes... Anna? And he mumbles it blearily. And Elizabeth looks at him and goes, No, it's me, Elizabeth. Are you alright? Booker gets to his feet and is like, I'll be fine. And as the full scope of the beach rushes up to meet us, we hear music. Elizabeth's face lights up and she's like, That's music! Real music! So this part of the game opens up a bit to us. Uh, despite falling into water, we are in fact still in Colombia. This all is Battleship Bay. The water, so it's like an ocean and a beach, and the water is just a series of pumps and rain catchers that creates the illusion of an ocean. It catches the rain from clouds. It seems like news of Booker's rampage hasn't reached here yet. The people are just relaxing, enjoying the sun, and we can spend quite a bit of time here exploring with Elizabeth, taking the sights, and through her curiosity and the contextual dialogue, we pick up a few things. Elizabeth has literally never left her tower. She has devoured books on everything, from lockpicking, which makes her very useful for exploration, to gun manufacturing, meaning she could toss us ammo and stuff in fights, and outside of the head researchers of Monument Island, she has never known another person. Not even Comstock. In fact, she sees a poster of him and is like, Comstock, I've read about him. They say he can see into the future. Give a man a little power, he falls in all kinds of love with himself. So she doesn't know that Comstock is her father. We don't know that Comstock's her father. Comstock did You're say did say you came to get my lamb. Yeah, I, I I I feel like we saw Comstock holding the lamb. Comstock said you came to get my lamb. I can put one and one together and make two, friend. Uh, yeah, but you're saying that like my lamb means that she's his daughter, which but his propaganda said, said the his lamb. Propaganda said that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for believing propaganda. I suppose. Yeah, that was our bad. <laughs> 
Yeah. So um, we're getting brainwashed already. Yeah, we should be. Columbia's more getting to us. Be well, more critical. Notably, uh, she admires pictures of Comstock's wife, the first lady, and she's like, "Oh, she's so beautiful." And when she sees that Columbia has segregated bathrooms, she questions why. The concept of racism isn't even on her radar. Good. It's alien to her. Um, again, she has never left her tower. She just doesn't know these concepts exist. They accidentally raised a decent human being. And also, they accidentally left all of the racist books from the turn of the century out of that library, which yeah, which is, is a little weird. weird. I I am slightly confused as to why a society that only has white people has segregated bathrooms. I know there's not only white people there. Well, there, there, there's like because we see. I, I, that, I thought that, we said they didn't want slaves. They didn't want slaves in the commercial and residential districts. This is a tourist district, yeah. so your janitors, your cleaners, and stuff. That cup, that couple, the, the awful thing at the start of the game, they were getting pan- punished because presumably because they were planning on having an interracial marriage, yes. correct? Yes, they were, yeah. So they're, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so she looks around, she loves it. She's like, oh, the first lady's so pretty and oh, Comstock, he can see the future, they say, but I don't know anything about this because I'm just Elizabeth not being in my tower. I'm just a silly little bell. Yep. Uh, and eventually we find her, because uh, she'll just kind of wander off and it's great. She, she'll wander yeah. off on her own and just look at things. Booker can go off and look at stuff and he'll come back and she'll be in the middle of something. I remember um, this came out around the same time as, as uh, um, The Last of Us Part yes, 1, at the yes. time, Part part 1. Was this the same time and, as that? Yeah, 2013. Oh my and, god. Um, I remember just both games blowing me away because it was kind of similar in the fact that Ellie and Elizabeth would both just wander around whatever sort of semi-open bit you were in, yep. looking at stuff. You had the choice of going over to engage with whatever they were engaging with. And I just remember it feeling uh, very fresh. Elizabeth is the game's greatest success. Oh, for sure. there, there are many problems with the game. This is the game's greatest success. In fact, the dev team had his own group whose only job was to work on Elizabeth. And they were called the Liz Squad. And they, <laughs> they did things like they made concept art from her from like one year old right up to present day so they could trace her entire life and just think about her holistically and everything about her. Um, the, the AI about her, they, there was a point, the first conversation they ever had was, can she talk? And in hindsight, this game wouldn't be the same if Elizabeth was mute. But initially, she was going to be a mute character. Um, she didn't look like this. She looked like a conservative woman with grey hair, very long kind of blouse and things. Um, but this is the Elizabeth we got. And yeah, I think they pull it off. I think she's fantastic. Um, so eventually, we find her dancing to folk music on a pier. Uh, and Book goes, goes, Booker goes to her. He's like, oh, come on, like we need to go. He's like, oh, come dance with me, Mr. DeWitt. And she reaches out with her hands. And he's like, I don't dance. Elizabeth's like, why? What could be better than this? And she does like a little jig to the music. Booker seizes his opportunity. She's like, what could be better than this? And he sees an airship overhead and he goes, how about Paris? And he points to a gigantic airship named the First Lady and a plan starts to form in his head. And Elizabeth goes, Paris? I I don't understand how we could get there. And Booker says, it's where that airship's going, lying. But if you want to stay here, she's like, no, 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 let's go, let's go right now. And she darts, she takes his hand and like pulls him in the direction of like where the airship is. Um, so they start heading off, but they don't get far. The mysterious red-headed couple who made Booker flip a coin have returned. And now they're holding two different brooches. Oh! <laughs> I, was waiting, I was waiting for the penny to drop. Oh, hello. <laughs> what, why, what are you helloing at? What it's, is it? It's the, the chief scientist. Yes, Lutess. Lutess on the right Who here. Very obviously would recognize Elizabeth. Yeah. And it's probably sat there going, where the fuck did, how did you get here? Absolutely. She definitely would recognize Elizabeth. So is, is he also a Lutess? Is this why the Lutess is, as you slipped earlier? He's just a gentleman. I'm gonna say he's another Lutess. They, they look like either siblings or husband and wife. Mm-hmm. The Lutesses. The, cool. the Lutesses. I, I'm not gonna pretend with you. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you much more. I'm not even gonna tell you his name. Yes, uh, they are the Lutesses. Yeah. Fucked it. Yeah, they're, they're twins. They're doing their thing. Are they so, twins? Uh, oh, okay, fine. I'll just tell you. He's Robert Lutess, and this is Rosalind Lutess. I don't... I don't is that yeah. spoiling something to tell me? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to keep up the air of mystery, that's all. But the Lutesses. Um, but well, notably, um, I think what's important is that we don't get audio logs from Robert. There's no, no propaganda about Robert. He's kind of just there. He's just kind of there. Rosalind is the, the figurehead of the two of them. Oh, just... I've got a smarter sibling, you know. <laughs> I, yeah. hmm. I don't. I am this one. <laughs> God help your family. So uh, the the man Robert says the bird, and then Rosalind says, "Or oh, the cage, or perhaps the bird. Nothing beats the cage." Booker's like, "Oh, these two again. Okay, never mind." And again, this is a player choice. But um, it's it's basically all it is is it's a brooch that will connect to Elizabeth's choker. Mm-hmm. It's a choice. Do you want the bird or the cage? The bird. You want the bird? The bird. Okay. Lovely. She's free. She wants freedom. Do these have impact? Uh, 
maybe. L- Lutes is basically like, surprising, I expected the cage. And then the man is like, well, if you're going to be a sore loser, I shan't do this again. And they walk off together and that's it. Well, they, they do not care that she's out of her tower. No. They don't seem to give a single shit. Uh, but yeah. Either they really think that she's got no chance of getting off this island, so there's not really an issue in her being out. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they wanted her out the whole time. So so as they journey on, um, Elizabeth kind of puts on the brooch and she, she looks at Booker and she says, if you're going to ask me, ask me. And Booker's like, ask you. And she goes, about my finger. If we missed it before, we definitely see now that her ring fin- uh, her sorry, her pinky is missing. There's a metal thimble attached to the stump. I just thought you might wonder, Elizabeth says. It's as much a mystery to me as anyone else. Maybe Songbird knows, but he's not talking. It's cool. Does think- Songbird talk? No, he doesn't talk. That's what she said. She- he's not talking. <laughs> well, that implies right now. No, he doesn't talk. Songbird doesn't talk. He shrieks. <laughs> That's what, yeah. Is Songbird like her best friend? Is that is that like she goes up to the window to do the Disney princess like call out to the birds and this Songbird <laughs> screeches down to the sky? <laughs> 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 um, she's like little bird. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. Big bird. Cinderella is getting no help making dresses from that thing. <laughs> yep. She, so Elizabeth is like, it's cool. I get to wear this stylish thimble to cover up my hideous deformity. I hear they're all the rage in Paris. Eventually, they make it to the ticket desk for the airship. Two tickets for passage to the First Lady airship, Booker says. And the man is on the phone and he goes, yeah, send in the bird. We're ready to execute. And then he hangs up the phone. And Booker's like, hey, pal, we're in a bit of a rush. Could you could you hurry this along? And the teller's like, certainly, sir. Is he just going to ignore the fact that guys just, like, send in the bird well, whilst get, we're running from a bird? You get another choice here. Oh. Uh, which is quite simply just to, like, keep playing pretend and being polite or draw your gun. Um, what do you want to do? Draw my gun. You draw your gun. Well, are we holding up facades for Elizabeth? How's, 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 how's good old Lizzie going to react to this? I'm going to play pretend. Because at least then, when I inevitably draw my gun, it will look like I'm protecting her. Wow, that makes me sound like a scumbag. <laughs> but we're gonna play pretend for now. This is the mindset the game wants you to be in. That's all I'm gonna say. Cool, great. Um, so yeah, cool. So you, do, you don't pull out your gun. You don't you don't attack him. So yeah. So um, Booker kind of leans on the desk and he goes. Well, my hand, my hands on the gun. <laughs> I'm ready. Well, no, you. that's not what happens. Booker puts both of his hands on the counter oh, and he's God. like... He's like, look at this. <laughs> look at it. He very much like... I'm like, the ad. <laughs> I'm the ad, AD. Uh, so he's like, uh, you know, could, could you hurry this up a little bit? And the guy goes, certainly, sir. Sorry about the weight. And he pulls out a knife and stabs it into Booker's hand. Not the AD hand, God the damn. other hand. You <laughs> so, couldn't yeah. be useful and get rid of the brand? Yeah. So uh, the guards suddenly open fire, uh, you know, B- Booker pulls the knife out and throws it to the side. He grabs his gun and just eviscerates every single guard in the place. Elizabeth hides to the side. Uh, during this stuff, she can't get hurt. She doesn't have a health bar. Um, but yeah, so, so he kills everybody. Nobody is left. When the dust settles, he's covered in blood. He and Elizabeth escape to a cable car. She goes, well, Mr. DeWitt, you look so hot covered in blood, just like those zombies. No, she is mad. Oh. She's like, you killed those people. And she's like visibly shaken by it. She goes, I can't believe you did that. You're a monster. It was self-defense. And Booker's like, I promise. What did you think was going to happen? Huh? Do you understand the expense people went through to keep you locked up in that tower? You are an investment and you will not be safe until you are far away from here. And Elizabeth's like, what did he want from me? And she starts to calm down a little bit. What does she want from me? Asks the girl who can open portals. And Booker goes, I don't know. But that's the last time anyone gets the drop on me. If you don't draw first, you don't get to draw at all. Elizabeth tears off a part of her skirt and she bandages up his hand. Anyway, part three. Eat everything that's on your plate. Okay. We head into another district, the Hall of Heroes. This is going to be quite uh, audio log heavy, this one. This is where you start getting more world building stuff. The airship is on the other side, but our journey into it is covered in obstacles. Guards to fight, doors to unlock, the usual. It's an amusement park, a museum and propaganda all rolled up into one. Almost like Comstock took a leaf out of Andrew Ryan's book. We see really grim posters encouraging children to sign up for national service to defend Columbia. We learn that people know about Songbird. You sign up for national service. Uh, You don't get a choice. What? It's a legal requirement. What? Between 18 and 25. So what? On my 18th birthday, signed up. I thought that was, that's something that, like, 
that like gammons say that we should be doing in the UK. Oh no, it is a legal requirement in the US. That's a thing in the US. Yeah, if 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 you haven't signed up by the time you're 26, uh, you can't get government jobs. You can't sign up for I think social care. So like I don't think you can get Medicare. Um, it's like basically you forfeit basically all like social stuff. Like, and what what is national service in this context? What do you do? You you're registering for the draft. There so like if we if we went to war, you would have to you would be. There isn't currently a military draft, but you're essentially putting your name down for the potential oh, of yeah. being drafted. Wow. Wow. But do you have to go to training or anything? When you sign up now, if, right. if you okay. get drafted, okay. yes. So I should point out that the National Service, as it's discussed in the UK, again, we don't have anything like this, uh, but as, as the proposition is in the UK is, you sign up, you join, like, the Territorial Army, basically, which means you go, you do some drills for, like, a couple of years, and then you come back. Uh, the idea is, it'll stop the youths from misbehaving. It's all that sort of nonsense. Yeah, I, didn't, no, I, didn't, no. I didn't know there was still a hypothetical draft, and obviously it's not yeah. being used since... Oh, there's been a lot of talk in, like, the past year well, of whether that. it's going to come back, because there's been a lot of talk as well of... Uh, Making it's only it's only men who have to sign up right now. Um, oh wow! Really? And there's been a lot of talk. I think in the, I mean there's always been a lot of talk, but I feel like I've seen a lot of it online specifically recently of whether they're going to start making women sign up for it as well. So anyway, we learn that people know about Songbird. There are plushies of him sold in <laughs> gift shops. Yeah. Wow. And considering a lot of the section is given over to fleshing out Columbia as a place, here are some audio logs. And um, because again, I've kind of held off on the audio logs. So the first is by Jeremiah Fink speaking to Comstock. And here's a poster that we find. Um, a good worker always has his eyes on the task at hand. And he says, I told you, Comstock, you sell them paradise and the customers expect cherubs for every chore. No menials in God's kingdom. Well, I've a man in Georgia who leases us as many black convicts as you can board. Why, you can say they're simple souls and penance for rising above their station. Whatever eases your conscience, I suppose. So, basically, he bought slaves from the surface, uh, for, from from down, down below. And I'm assuming that on the surface, hmm. it's followed American history where... Yeah, there's racism, but like, there's not slavery at this point. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like, it's human trafficking. Do you want me to move on? No, I just, I was going to say, I can't, I really hope we get a chance to kill the fuck out of this guy. Yeah, me too. Um, next is uh, the mercenary called Preston Downs, who's a fascinating character. This is a side character thing, um, but really interesting. He said, oh God, how am I going to do this? Um, he's Texan. Like he's real. Would you like? Would you like Neil to read it? <laughs> he can bring back his old cowboy voices. I'm just gonna go with whatever oh, I can do. Here we go. Strap in. <laughs> <laughs> Judgment's on. I'm actually expecting good things. So Preston Downs says, "Calm, stop. Came by the wagon at dawn. Man was just he just transfixed by my trophy scalps. Asked about the white ones there." I said, well, sir, if your quarry dwells in the jungle and beds down with a local color, why split hairs? <laughs> Not a chuckle out of him, though. No. Either he ain't seen a mango native, or maybe, maybe too many. Anyhow, now he's got me hunting down this Daisy Fitzroy. Hope he don't expect me to stuff him out her. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, press some decks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to get more press and downs. Really interesting character. But key thing to learn there is basically Comstock came to him and was like... I Tra you're a hunter, you're going to track down Daisy Fitzroy for me. Sir, I hunt bears through the woods, <laughs> not a lady through a city. These are, seem like different skill sets. Well, important to note, he did say about the, about the, the white scalps. He hunts people too. Yeah, uh, he doesn't care. He's, he's just a hunter. Um, so who is Daisy Fitzroy? We heard a little bit about her back during the fair, but now we're going to properly get to hear from her. Here's an audio log by her. Art by Iara Art. Ooh, I like her. Yeah, really gorgeous like art her. here of Daisy. Um, and that's one of the posters we find. Uh, Daisy Fitzroy, here's your voice. Join the Vox Populi. She's dope as hell. Yeah, she's really cool. Um, so Daisy. Freedom fighter. Audio log by Daisy says, yes. And she says, she's, uh, just for those listening, she is a black woman. And she says, when I first seen Columbia, that sky was the brightest, bluest sky that ever was. Seemed like heaven. Then your eyes adjusted to the light and you saw that sea of white faces looking hard back at you. Days at Comstock House was simple. Hard work, sure, but simple. Wringing the linens, scrubbing the floors. Hm. Lady Comstock, she even had a kind word now and then. Almost enough to make me think I had a place in their world. God made foolish girls so we could have something to play with. So Daisy worked for, she was the servant for uh, the slave, sorry, for Lady Comstock. I see. Uh, for the first lady. 
But she also said that she says here basically that the first lady was relatively kind to her. Uh, so for for what it's worth, no, nothing. <laughs> yeah, basically she didn't beat her. Is kind yeah, of the extent yeah, of it. Yeah. Out of curiosity, uh, as of this point, are we to assume that Daisy is still up on Concord, maybe leading some freedom fighters? Columbia. 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 Why do we call it Daisy Fitzroy is still about. Okay, Never and and so that. the Vox Populi is a group. A resistance group, I suppose, yeah. in Colombia. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, an underground resistance. We're going to learn more about Daisy later, but she is active right now. Dope as hell. Um, so yeah, the four. Uh, the next one is by Comstock, uh, musing on his prophetic visions. Art by Nexus Yokai. It is one thing to imagine one's future, and another to see it. I have seen the seeds of fire that will prepare the Sodom below for the coming of the Lord, but Elizabeth shall sow those seeds, not I. I will fall before the job is done, but she shall take up my mantle. Much like Lamb, you know, was ready to pass over to, you know, I'm not going to get this yeah. work done. It's it's, uh, it's my child that's going to do it. I yeah. feel like that if he wanted her to follow in his footsteps, he did a really poor job of what educational materials he left in that tower. <laughs> that's a really good point. They should have been a bit more brainwashy. Mm -hmm. Not that I want Elizabeth to be brainwashed, but... Well, bear in mind, he claims to have seen the future, so he probably thinks this is the way to, to get to that future. Like, maybe he's seen the path to it. Who knows? I don't know. I, but he claims to have seen the future. So um, he, he goes on and he says, so he's like, I'm going to die before Elizabeth. The Lord is calling me home. I feel his love in every tumor because they are the train which takes me to his station. And I go with joy, knowing that Elizabeth will take my unearthly place. But the false shepherd is coming to lead my lamb astray. I will not board that train until she is safe from his deceptions. And here's one last one by an old military general called Cornelius Slate. This is just some uh, art from the, uh, the concept book. Here's some um, trashed designs. This is what he actually looks like. Um, so the previous trash designs had him almost um, embracing cartoonish depictions of Native Americans, of uh, Chinese people. Um, so yeah, but in the end, they just went for old uh, colonial American officer. And and he's he's... Are we to assume a soldier of Columbia? Uh, yes. Okay. He says, My men and I are doomed. Doomed as noble Custer was at Little Bighorn. But we shall not yield to Comstock and his ten soldiers. But my scout has seen him. Booker DeWitt is coming here. To the hall. DeWitt, he was at wounded knee. For all the grisly trophies he claimed. A man such as he might just grant us the peace we seek. So he ha hates Comstock and knows Booker is coming and is waiting for him. So is 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 he a Vox Populi or is no. he on Comstock's side even if just disguising? Good question. Slate's an interesting one. He is the boss of this domain. We're about to learn a lot about him. Um, so yeah, so Slate is the boss of this domain. Whoever he is, he seems to know Booker's name. He's taken over the Hall of Heroes. A lot of people know Booker. Yes. Uh, so he's taken over the Hall of Heroes, which is a museum given over to celebrating Columbia's glory. It's also a little bit of historical revisionism. It's rewriting a lot of Columbia's history to whitewash it and make it less bloody and glorify the wars of the past. Um, and he is waiting for us inside. Booker and Elizabeth jump into an elevator that takes them up to the hall. And as it rumbles along, Elizabeth starts waving her hand in front of her face. And she's like, oh, there's a being here. Oh, I hate these things. Um, Booker's like, just, just kill it. And Elizabeth's like, what? No, it'll sting me. Wait, I've got a better idea. Does she open a portal? <laughs> Whoosh, she tears another hole in reality. <laughs> a window appears and the bee flies away. And Booker's like, whoa, Jesus, what is this? And Elizabeth's like, it's a tear. And it's like, what is a tear? And she's like, it's like a window into another world. Most of the time they're dull. A different colored towel, tea instead of coffee. But sometimes, sometimes I see something amazing and I pull it through. And Booker's like, don't suppose you got an airship in there. Oh, so she has been time traveling. Uh, time traveling, it's its a tear in reality. That's all we know right now. And I will, I will flag to you that the Paris one, re revenge of the Jedi, not return of the Jedi. You know, it's an, almost like an alternate reality, perhaps. Well, this already isn't our reality, is it? So. I was more just under the yeah. assumption of this is dozens of years prior to... George Lucas even being born. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the point she makes here is and like... And that we've already pointed out the fact there's a lot of more modern songs appearing here. Mm -hmm. 
She does say, a window into another world, sometimes they're dull, a different colored towel, tea instead of coffee. So it's like, there's little changes sometimes. Mm. But sometimes, sometimes I see something amazing and I pull it through. And because I yeah, got an airship in there, and she's like, no, that's not how it works. I can't pick where we go. I wouldn't even know how. Entering the Hall of Heroes, Booker's teeth are set on edge, because in the main hall is a giant statue of Comstock. Oh. Underneath it says, Father Comstock, commander of the 7th Cavalry at Wounded Knee. <sighs> Booker looks at it and mutters under his breath, That man did not lead the 7th. Hell, I don't even remember him being there. Did we, on that wooden box at the very start, did that not say... It was the 7th. Yeah. Okay, so 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 Booker, Booker was Booker, in the 7th. Booker yeah. fought at Wounded Knee in the 7th, and Comstock's claiming he led the 7th at Wounded Knee, and Booker's saying he, he wasn't even he wasn't there. He wasn't even there. Interesting. Yeah, he's a lying prick. Usual sort of historical revisionism stuff. Cool, cool. <clears throat> Suddenly, a spotlight turns on, a silhouetted figure hides behind it. Cornelius Slate. And Slate's like, Booker DeWitt proved his worth on the field that day. And Booker immediately recognizes him. They were both brothers in arms. Booker was like, you were at Wounded Knee Slate. You were definitely there. Um, they served together. They used to be friends. But now something has changed. Slate isn't the warrior he once was. He seems kind of broken. And he goes, you've always been different, haven't you, Booker? You never craved glory. Well, you speak out against Comstock, reveal his lies, and he doesn't like that. He's coming. And now all my men have left is a choice. Die at the hands of a tin soldier like Comstock, or a real one like you. Come, give me and my men a soldier's death. Um, so that's what he was. He's just, he's just gone mad. And he's like, I'm not going to let Comstock come for me with his millions of It sounds men. like gone mad. This more sounds like lost to despair, kind of. Uh, yeah, also lost to despair. Yeah. Like he's just like, I, I don't have another choice. I'd rather go out on terms that better fit me. This is basically all here just so we have someone to fight in the Hall of Heroes. So we're fighting Slate and Slate's men who, who are also soldiers who, who have joined him. Um, so we fight through statues and exhibits. We oh, yeah. okay. Um, so we see that an old, separate from this, we see that an old statue of Cornelius Slate once lived here, but Comstock tore it down and replaced it with the statue of himself. So this used to be a statue of Slate. Um, oh. Booker becomes more and more frustrated that the Prophet would even want to be associated with Wounded Knee and try to turn it into some glorious moment in history. It wasn't glorious, it was horrific. But it's not just Wounded Knee, so this is Wounded Knee. Um, this is like, it's like an exhibition you walk through. It, it's stereotyped. Yeah, again, horrible cartoonish uh, uh, sort of statues of native people. Yep. Um, and uh, heroic looking white man that I assume is Slate, the, the original statue at the bottom. Uh, no, 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 that's no. just uh, someone else. No, uh, I don't have a picture of you. When you find Slate's statue, it is like a way in a cupboard, basically, right, like, right, like right. a massive warehouse at the back, and it's t tipped over, it's cracked. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but it's not just this one we fight through. Uh, Comstock claims to have fought on Wounded Knee, but he also claims to have fought in the Boxer Rebellion. And again, he is lying about this too, according to Slate. Booker wasn't there for this one, but Slate was. In 1900, Chinese nationalists... Uh, do, you, do either of you know anything about the Boxer Rebellion? I didn't know anything about I this. I don't know. No. So I, I basically I'm taking this from like the wiki. Uh, but this is a real event, apparently, that happened. In 1900, Chinese nationalists launched an attack on Chinese Christians. Against the wishes of the United States government, the, in the world of Bioshock Infinite, against the wishes of the United States government, Comstock ordered Colombian forces into Beijing to save Americans who lived there. Because so, by this point, Colombia's there and it's part of the US. It's flying in the sky, but it's like another state. Uh, so, oh. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so th there was a point in which Colombia was always flying, but it was part of the US until Comstock was like, not. Nah. Oh, actually, looted. no. No, sorry, ignore me. Colombia was, um, I don't really know exactly what Colombia was. Let's just say it was a state on land in America. Secession Day was the day that it flew into the sky and left the US. So by the time it's in the sky, How it's dramatic. no longer a... Uh, uh, yeah. Colombia is the drama. <laughs> Colombia is the drama. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so basically... Comstock ordered Colombian forces into Beijing to save Americans who lived there. Slate led the army. Comstock remained at central command. This is the story as Slate tells it. And when the dust settled, the US government accused Comstock of being a traitor to the nation because he acted against the government's wishes. Again, Comstock, a guy that doesn't like the government. It was this accusation that led to Colombia seceding from the United States, building its flying city, and heading off into the clouds. When we kill Slate's men, he rings out on the speaker. 
You did them a favor, Booker. You let them die like men. You're a hero to them. And Booker's like, I have no quarrel with these men, Slate. I never claimed to be no hero. And Slate's like, you'll find me on the other side of the First Lady's Memorial. You've seen how Comstock rewrote my history. Now see how he's rewritten his own. And we do see. A statue of Lady Comstock, as she prays in her chambers, shows a statue of Daisy Fitzroy hiding around the corner, preparing to strangle her. Another statue of Comstock, as he carries a baby up to the Angel Columbia, up to Monument Island. There's a beat as Elizabeth drinks this in, and there's a pre-recorded monologue. Lo, Comstock says, while Daisy Fitzroy has murdered my beloved, she shall not have the child. The seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Elizabeth looks at it and then looks at Booker and goes, Am I? Comstock's daughter, Booker says. You didn't know? Elizabeth shakes her head. No, I, I can't be. I can't. He wants you to follow in his footsteps, Booker says. Well, I want a puppy, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get one, Elizabeth snaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there you go. Officially confirmed, Elizabeth, his daughter. Um, you called it. Well done. Um, big twist. <laughs> and uh, anyway. Oh, yeah. Big, 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 big twist. <laughs> Definitely wasn't shown 50 times prior to this. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, eventually we have a boss fight with Slate and his men. We kick his ass, and the last of the and as the last of the air leaves his lungs, he grabs Booker, and he says, "We're not done here, soldier!" And he's frothing in the mouth, and he says, "Eat everything that's on your plate. Finish it!" And he presses a pistol into Booker's hand, and he goes, "They haven't changed you, Booker. Not one bit." Choice time. Do you kill Slate or leave him? I feel like I want to kill him. Because co-soldier in arms, he's gonna die regardless, mm. and he kind of wants to go out on his terms. Yeah, from a friend. Oh, I don't. Uh, it sounds. It feels icky to say any of that. I think. Um, I don't know if this helps at all, but <clears throat> my understanding and my reading of Slate is that Slate does not believe in the Columbia Dream. Yeah. He he doesn't. Um, again, he's not an anti-racist, right? He could have acted, yeah, acted on behalf. Yeah, acted on behalf of it, but he didn't do it because he thought he had to purge or, or anything like that. He did it because he is just a, a, a warrior who likes to fight. And to be honest. It's very racist, his belief here, but his thought was like, Native Americans are amazing fighters and I want to get in there and fight with them. And uh, You know, he's, he's a man that wants to wrestle tigers. That's his entire motivation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that helps, but... Uh, I mean, I, I, I think we're going we're, we're gonna to go ahead and kill him. Okay, cool. No problem. Um, Sorry, Slate. Sure, fair enough. So uh, Booker pulls the trigger, Slate dies, and Comstock's voice booms say, over the speakers. This game is doing a better job of mm -hmm. making me actually think... Well, to a degree, think about the choices. That's interesting. Then Bioshock, where I'm kind of like, no, we're doing this one. <laughs> well, you no, you say that, right? This is the first one you've really thought about. But bird or cage, you went on bird. Uh, be racist or don't be racist. You know, like... Um, <laughs> well, th yes. But I thought about zero of them in Bioshock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, so Columbia... Uh, so Comstock suddenly, like, interrupts. He speaks over the speakers. And he says... DeWitt will abandon you, my sweet Elizabeth. What else can you expect from a liar and killer of women? And Elizabeth glares at one of the speakers. Specifically women? Mm, he's, being, he's being quite specific. Elizabeth glares at one of the speakers and is like, Father, prophet, whoever you are, I'm leaving, and there's nothing you could do to stop me. So the team make it to the First Lady airship. Yay! Booker starts spinning dials and pulling levers on the airship, programming coordinates. I love those lamps. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of green, it's, green it's, it's desk like, lamp. It's yeah. like, like old time. It's like the green, like frosted glass. It's like kind of elongated and curved. We had one at home. It's always got the really fun uh, metal chain pull strings mm -hmm. and like the brass base. Oh, I love that lamp. 10 out of 10 game. So they get onto the airship and, and the Booker Star's programming coordinates. Uh, and Elizabeth's like, oh, I can't wait to see Paris. And then she squints at the coordinates and she goes, wait, what is that? 40 north by 74 west. That's not Paris. Why is That's she New no York. Coordinates? How did you know that, Booker says. It's a box, but still. And Elizabeth says, One thing I had in that tower was time, Mr. DeWitt. Time to study things like geography. And Booker's like, look, I owed money. There's a fellow who, he offered to wipe away my debt in exchange for you. Elizabeth's face crumples and she starts to cry. And Booker's like, come on. It, 
It's going to be okay. Talk to me. Come on, let me sell you off. And before he can finish that sentence, Elizabeth whirls around and hits him over the head with a wrench. Hey. Booker blacks out. Good. End of part three. She's like, I'm going back to my bird dad. I miss bird dad. Part four, Finkton. When Booker comes to, Elizabeth is nowhere to be seen and strangers have taken over the ship. Pinned to the ground by someone unseen, he looks out of the doorway down onto the district of Finkton and sees black jailhouse workers mining rock, singing a chain gang tune overseen by a handyman, the, the metallic me mechanical man from the beginning. Roughly, he's brought to his feet and we meet Daisy Fitzroy. Oh. So, she says, you're this false shepherd we've been hearing so much about. Caused a mess of trouble at the raffle. And Booker's like, you Fitzroy, I got no quarrel with you or your Vox Populi. This is my airship you're hanging me out of, and I got perilous need of it. Really? Because this sure shit looks like old Comstock's airship to me. And Booker's like, listen, I'm not looking for a fight. And Daisy cuts in immediately. She goes, there's already a fight, do it. Only question is, which side are you on? Comstock is the god of the white man, the rich man. But if you believe in common folk, you'll help us. And Booker's like, I just want my ship. Where's Bill Williamson? <laughs> <laughs> and Daisy is like, and the Vox will give her to you. But first, you gotta do something for us. Down in Finkton is a gunsmith who can supply weapons to our cause. Get our guns from him, and you can have your ship back. Whoosh! She pushes Booker out of the airship, and with a thud, he lands in Finkton. Wow! Good thing he's sturdy, I guess. Yeah. Oh, like, it was low by that point. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's Daisy Fitzroy. That's our mission. Off to get some guns. Um, so, Finkton is an industrial factory town owned by the inventor, tinkerer, and slave driver, Jeremiah Fink. It's here that the lower classes eke out a living under his thumb. Black people are slaves. Everyone else is kept firmly in line. Black people are slaves, but Irish people are here. Native American people are here. They're not slaves. They're like one rung up on the ladder, but barely. Yeah. Support, just, just to note that they do distinguish here for some reason. Odd. Um, so everyone else is kept firmly in line. We see them work away robotically, tiredly building vending machines to sell vigors, mining rock and working factory lines. And of course, we see Elizabeth. She's just trying to sneak through the district, but when she sees Booker, her eyes widen with fear and she darts off into a sprint. Just as we're about to catch her, we're interrupted by a handyman. Fall, shepherd! He roars and throws Booker over the railing. He's going to fall to his death. Oh no! But shoom! A tear opens, bringing through part of the soft balloon of an airship to break his fall. I saved your life! Elizabeth shouts. She's like on the pier and Booker's like hanging there as like it levitates up towards her. And she's like, I saved your life, but do not attempt to follow me, Mr. DeWitt. And Booker's like, I made an arrangement to get our airship back. And Elizabeth's like, you can get us out of here? And Booker's like, yes! I just, I need to supply enough weapons to arm an entire uprising, but you know, uh, we can do this together. What do you say, partners? Wow, she's very much turned around despite knowing that that ship's gonna get her out of here and just to his different contacts. Elizabeth takes a moment and then she says, you're a liar, Mr. DeWitt. And the I fuck? think that we're gonna get to the very end of this game mm -hmm. and it's going to be Andrew Ryan who's <laughs> trying to get her. Oh, Andrew Ryan's the man that commissioned Booker, you think? Okay, yes. sure. Uh, again, nothing to do with Bioshock 1, but fine. Nope, so, I, I'm dying on this hill. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, and, and Elizabeth goes like, You're a liar, Mr. DeWitt, and a thug, but you're also my only means of reaching Paris. So, the team is back together. Uh, into Finkton we go, and here's a couple of interesting things we see along the way. So, number one, time is the currency that runs through Finkton. We've witnessed a full auction where the auctioneer is selling work to people, and they're bidding the only thing on them, their time. A plumbing, yeah, so for example, a plumbing job is up for grabs, and one guy's like, I'll do it in 13 minutes, and another is like, 12, and then boom, it's sold. So people are so desperate for work, the work is literally being auctioned off to them. Um, but how, how do they, are, are they saying they will complete it in that long? Yes, and if they don't complete it in that time, they won't get paid. If it takes them 15 minutes and they, they bid 12, you know, and it's like, Finkton oh. isn't paying them by the hour, he's paying them by the minute. So oh. yeah, this is the only way people are able to get work in here. Oh. Finkton is auctioning the work off. It's grim. Odd. A humongous clock tower tells us that Fink closely regulates how his workers spend their day. 11 hours of labor, one hour of prayer, 30 minutes to eat, etc. 
Fink tells us more during a welcome speech that plays over the tannoy, and he says, Greetings! My name is Jeremiah Fink. What is the most admirable creature on God's green earth? Why, it's the bee! Have you ever seen a bee on vacation? Have you ever seen a bee take a sick day? Well, my friends, the answer is no. So I say, be the bee. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's so, so scummy. Um, so while we explore, Elizabeth finds a copy of her mother's diary and she reads a passage from it. This is all extra stuff. And she goes, my, she reads and she says, she reads, my husband claims the child was created from whole cloth by divine will. I am a believer, but I'm no fool. His bastard shall not be raised under this roof. Wait, what? Reading through the diary, Elizabeth realizes what it means. It was her mother who had her locked in the tower. Her mother didn't think Elizabeth belonged to her. Mm. Did did her mother not assumedly give birth to her? No, that's what she's saying. Jer- um, Comstock came back one day and said, there's been a miracle baby. Mm. We, God has given us a miracle baby. And she's gone, mm, no, that's not that's our bullshit. child. That's yeah. not how miracles work, yeah. Next, audio log. Preston Downs, the mercenary hired to track down Daisy Fitzroy. It seems he's here in Finkton somewhere, still on the hunt. And he sounds exhausted in this one. And he goes, Well, Fitzroy, you you got a little cunning in you, if nothing else. Dropped a couple of grizzly traps around the lines up here. Idea was to, to bleed one of your couriers till he gave you up. Set to course, you're using kids now. Now I got this tiny Native American boy eyeballing me. Had to take his leg off. Ugh. Damn thing's just lying here between us. I sure wish he'd cry or summon. Anyway, uh, there's also Jeez. one by... Yeah, this is grim. Uh, and again, so this is actually not a picture from where you find the that audio log. Uh, when you find out there's the trap and there's the leg. Are um, we... The take... boy is gone. Oh, is the leg still there? The leg's still there. The boy is gone. Are we to take that as the boy willingly is doing this or that Daisy's using slaves as well? Very good question. Not further explored. Cool. Daisy Fitzroy. Not further explored now or ever? Adam? Ever. Oh. This does not go any deeper than that. Um, <sighs> you're beginning to see a little bit of why people don't like the portrayal of the Vox Populi in this game. So regardless, we're going to move on. Um, so here's another one. Uh, it's an audio log by Jeremiah Fink in the Good Time Club, the only bar in Finkton. Um, Fink's workers did not get paid in money, but in tokens. This means workers have to spend their earnings in an establishment owned by their boss. Good stuff. Basically, he's paying them, but it's not. It's slave labor because all the money goes back to him. It's a mess. There's a so he leaves a message. Fink leaves a message to his brother very Albert. Very Sinclair. It's very Sinclair. Um, in real life, it's very Amazon. It's very Walmart. These are things that they do. They pay their bonuses in company credits. Mm. Um, and it's also like a thing that actually happened back in the day. He's left a audio log for his brother Albert, Albert Fink, the guy who set up the barbershop quartet. So you got Jeremiah, you got Albert. Albert's in charge Aww. of the music. Jeremiah's in charge of everything else. I had thought you a fool, dear brother, when you told me that you heard wonderful music trumpeting from tears in thin air. I began to doubt your mental integrity, but... Not only have you made your fortune from these doodads, you have lit the path for me as well. So Albert Fink, like God only knows, etc. He heard this music come through tears. That's how he got these songs. That's why all these songs we know are in Colombia. Wait, so is, is Elizabeth just opening tears all throughout Colombia then? Or is there more Terry stuff? Or is, it that these, that? or is it that these two were quite senior in society, so might have had access to the research facility to watch her? It's not, I will tell you now, because it's not explicitly explained later, um, like at all. Uh, my understanding is that the tears are just happening. Elizabeth's the only one who can open them herself, but sometimes they will just like spontaneously pop up. Not massive ones, things aren't coming through them, but it's like, like, a, like a t- literally a tear, like a shimmer in reality for a second and you can hear something and... It seems like Albert Fink heard them and was like, oh, I'm going to, great music, I'm going to rip this off and note it down the music. So, so then we find one by a woman called Hattie Gerst, where we learn a bit more about handymen and why people would volunteer for Fink to experiment on them. So oh, here's some, geez, here's some oh. concept art for, for handymen. Um, geez, oh. So Hattie Gerst says, Samuel always thought that the pew on Sunday went hand in hand with the desk on Monday. Science is the slow revelation of God's blueprint. After two years in the Lamb's Tower on Monument Island, he took ill with cancer of the stomach. So, her husband got cancer from hanging about Monument Island. Mm. I prayed to the prophet, and the prophet delivered unto us a miracle through his servant, Fink. 
I do not know if I will ever get used to a husband bound in a skeleton of metal, but better a handyman than a dead one. So the handymen are terminally ill people who are being kept alive by all the mechanical stuff. Yeah. Huh. It seems like they volunteered themselves for this, which is interesting in contrast to Rapture. Anyway, here's another one. Some words from Daisy Fitzroy. This is our final audio log where she says, They argued something fierce at night. Lady Comstock and the Prophet could never make out what it was about for my bunk, though. After the worst of it, I seen she ain't left for morning prayer. So I crept upstairs to check in on her. And like a fool, I lingered. Scullery maid was what they called me when I walked into Comstock House. Murderer was what they shouted when I ran out. So Daisy Fitzroy heard Comstock and Lady Comstock fighting, went in the next day, was around for too long, and she claims that she was framed for the murder of Lady Comstock. So, yeah, it's possible she, like, came across the body of, of Lady Comstock then in her story Classic. and ran away. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that it's probably... Comstock who killed her. Uh, that that is the insinuation here. Yes. Uh, I don't think it's ever explicitly stated, but like it's basically confirmed. Um, also, we, we don't have this here, but just one final thing on Daisy Fitzroy that I think adds a lot of context to her. Um, think b there was a factory. One of Fink's factories was on an airship floating as part of the city, and uh, in order to cut costs, Fink, all of Daisy's friends were in there as slaves, and Fink just blew it out of the sky to cut costs. Wow. Um, so also just another thing to add, like, why would Daisy Fitzroy form the Vox? I mean, for all these reasons, as a revolutionary, but she's also just a deeply angry person who was framed for a murder and watched all of her friends get killed by Fink. Yeah, Daisy Fitzroy, great character. After exploring, Booker and Elizabeth make it to the workshop of the gunsmith, Chen Lin. But Lin is nowhere to be seen. Just his crying wife praying at an altar with Chinese paraphernalia, statues, etc. She tells the pairing that some guards came, seized him, and took him to the Good Time Club. So, down into the club they go, further still into the basement, where Fink's personal jail cells sit. The sort of place he kept dissenters, unionists, and all them dirty socialist types. Um, so as they're heading down and, Book and Elizabeth's like unlocking doors and stuff, Booker's like, I used to work for folks like Fink. And Elizabeth's like, doing what? And he goes, I, I was with the Pinkertons. They'd call us in. <laughs> the Pinkertons. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, in this case, they would be the Pinkertons. <laughs> so yeah, I was with the Pinkertons. They'd call us in when workers got restless to demonstrate the folly of men striking, you know, throwing down tools. Oh, were, they were they still the Pinkertons in the 1913s? The, the, the yeah, they would have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pinkertons yeah. were around for. They're still, they're still around, around technically. I, but th I thought today. I thought they evolved into th what's now the Secret Service. No, they are. They are. They are still Pinkertons out there today, ah. uh, operating under Pinkertons. Except they're a private organization. Or the FBI. I thought that they like evolved no, the into a government agency. The FBI no. are, are cops technically. The Pinkertons were never were never cops or po or police. Or or um, I thought I remembered this from when we. Did I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, much of their function, yeah, like CIA have been used to bust unions and all yeah. sorts of horrible mal malignant shit over the years, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, B Booker! Yeah, so yeah, Booker was a Pinkerton, and Elizabeth's like, you hurt people. And Booker says, I'll tell you this, sometimes there's precious need for folks like Daisy Fitzroy. And Elizabeth mm. says, why? And he goes, because of folks like me. Mm. Then Fink interrupts, calling us up on the radio. And he says, do wit, you are a lion, sir. <laughs> now I know Fitzroy has some calling, but I think you'll find your business with her and Mr. Lin has come to an end. We enter one of the jail cells. Chen Lin is dead. No! And it's, oh, that's gruesome. It's really bad. They've beaten him to death. And uh, I feel like, I feel like blood never really stood out in Bio, mm -hmm. like Bioshock 1, in, like down in Rapture, but because of how Disney and cartoony and bright everything is, the blood really, really stands out in this one. Yeah, there's a distinct contrast between how grotesque the violence is compared to, like, the, the shiny, silly stuff at the very beginning of the game. Um, like the like the blood splatters in the back wall are... Oh. Mm. So, Jin Le, Chen Lin has been gruesomely murdered, and Booker stares at him. He's like, God damn it! Now we need to find someone else to make those guns! <laughs> That's all he cares about. And Elizabeth is like, no, uh, maybe maybe we could, because she thinks maybe there's a chance to save him, and Booker just says, dead is dead, Elizabeth. And he says this with, like, ice in his voice. And then a familiar voice. Rosalind, Lutes, and the man who's always alongside her, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. They're great. Dead, the man says, is dead. And he flips his coin. 
Because like, where the hell did you two come from? They're such weirdos, I love them. Yeah, he's, he's more annoyed by them now than Chen Lin's demise. He's like, these two freaks. So Rosalind kind of catches the coin and she looks at it and she goes, I see heads and I see tails, the man says. It's all a matter of perspective. And Booker's like, why are you following us? Are you working for Comstock? And They're the so much better than Tenenbaum. And the man's like, what do you see from this angle? And he kind of like peers, at Chen, squints at Chen Lin. And Rosalind goes, dead. Then they both kind of crane their neck to the left. And the man goes, and that angle? And she goes, alive. And Elizabeth's like, Booker. And Booker turns to see a tear in reality. And she goes, there's a tear here. It's another Columbia, Elizabeth says. A Columbia where Chen Lin is alive? It's like riding a bicycle, the man says. One never really forgets, Rosalind says. One just needs the courage to climb aboard. The lights flicker for a split second, and then they're gone. <laughs> Elizabeth uh, stares at the tear and she says, we need to go through. I don't know how this tear got here, but if we go through, I don't know if I'll be able to bring us back. And Booker's like, okay, open it then. And whoosh, through the tear they go. Chen Lin is gone. Booker and Elizabeth rush back to his gun shop. And what we see is that that's not the only thing that's changed. The altar... Wait, so they, they, they went through the tear? They go through the tear now. They're okay. in a different reality. Odd. The altar has changed. Uh, Chen Lin's wife. It's now an altar to Comstock and Columbia. No signs of, you know, dragons or, or any Chinese flags. Just the Colombian flag. Chen Lin's wife isn't Asian anymore, she's now Caucasian. And Chen Lin is standing in his workshop. But there are no machines here. He absently cranks an invisible lever. And Booker's like, Mr. Lin? And Chen Lin's like, who are you? And he looks off into the distance, he can't quite see us, and he goes, speak up, I can't hear you over all these machines. Be careful, they're dangerous, very loud. This isn't a place for stupid people, get out of here. And Booker's like, what's wrong with him? And Elizabeth says, remember him dead in that cell? Maybe in some way he remembers that? Maybe he thinks he's in both worlds? Temporally displaced. So we learn that the Chen Lin's tools are waiting for us all the way down in the shanty town under Finkton. It's a horrible sight. It's where the people live who can't get work from Fink. Protest signs and posters for the Vox Populi are plastered on the walls. It looks like Comstock's people don't come down here. They don't care to. This is because of Fink, Elizabeth says, looking at the homeless children curled up in the corner. Maybe Daisy Fitzroy's right. Maybe she should pay him back for all of this. And Booker's like, not before she pays us. We're here for guns and an airship. It's in the evidence room of the Columbia police that we find Chenlin's weaponry. And I don't have a picture of it, but on the, on the walls inside the police station are posters saying protecting racial purity. Yeah, gross. Uh, so they find the weaponry though. It's a humongous pile of metal, ammunition, and machinery. Good thing they found them, but there's a little problem. Can you imagine what the problem might be with all of this? They're stupid people, and he said no stupid people here. Yes, okay, aside from that, what are they gonna do, how, what are they gonna do with these weapons? Shove it through a tear. Where, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, Booker's is, like- Is that meant to be a twist? No, it's just, it's just, Booker looks at all of these weapons, big factory, heavy metal, somehow they gotta get this to Fitzroy. And Booker's like, well we sure as hell aren't gonna be able to carry this back to the shop. God, we didn't think this through. And then, because the plot needs to happen, a tear happens. So Elizabeth's like, wow, look, a tear. Oh, isn't that amazing? That's gonna take us to another version of Columbia. Why did they make it an artificial one and not just be like, oh, I, I opened it, Wee. Because Elizabeth can't open tears at will. She can only tap into existing tears. Oh. Yes. Oh, that wasn't how I understood it. Okay. So, okay. okay yes. I, th I thought that there were naturally one, naturally occurring ones and there were Elizabeth created ones. No, she's, she's just the only person who could tap into these tears. You're seeing, this is what they look like. Got um, it. So she just finds them and she has power over them. Yes. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so yeah, she's like, oh, a tear, isn't that amazing? Oh, well, uh, this is going to take us to another version of Columbia that doesn't have any tools in it. If the tools aren't there, then they have to be back at the shop. So into the tear we go, into Columbia number three. <laughs> But Wait, why are we on three? Yeah. We went from zero to one to three. No, we went to one, one to two, two to three. three. Oh, <laughs> we didn't start at zero. <laughs> we should have started at zero. Well, we're not. Everything one. should start at zero. We're going into Stop Columbia. talking zero. about Yakuza. It's a superior <laughs> counting system. And I was talking about computer science. Naturally, a lot is different in Columbia number three as well. 
Daisy Fitzroy's revolution is no longer an underground movement, preparing for war. It is now in full swing. Buildings are on fire, red banners mark locations that have been conquered by the Vox. It's war giving his fallout. Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Aesthetically. I still don't get you, but I'm sure, if that's if you like that, sure. <laughs> What's important is that war has come to Colombia and Fitzroy is now waging war on Comstock. Elizabeth is like, oh my goodness, it's just like Les Miserables. Da <laughs> <laughs> Daisy's moved these people and we can be a part of it. And Booker's like, I don't want to be a part of it. Nothing's changed. We get our airship and we get well shot of this place. And then we see it. A red Vox Populi poster. Booker DeWitt is on the poster, his hand raised in solidarity. Oh. DeWitt, it says, martyr of the revolution. Hmm. In this world... You're a hero, Elizabeth says. And Booker has a moment as he stares at it and he says, I remember, I led the Vox with Daisy. Mm. This one was also smarter. He put a glove over his AD hand. Sure. I never noticed that was a glove, but yeah. It, it, it's covering the AD. Well, so, he, so it's like the memories almost like start to seep into him a little bit. And he goes, Slade and I, we, we burned down the Hall of Heroes. I have... I've got two memories in the same place. His head hurts, everything goes fuzzy, and his nose starts to bleed. We see bodies littering the streets. Vox soldiers, Fink guards, everyday Colombians. Fitzroy's not taking any prisoners. Her voice echoes out over the city, rallying her troops. Booker DeWitt died for this day, she says. It was he who spoke with one voice of the people. Now is the time to stand true to his cause. Now is the time for Fink to fall. To the factory! And Elizabeth's like, you were a martyr. And she's almost in awe of the hero that this reality's Booker was. <laughs> and, and Booker shakes his head and he goes, these people need a better class of hero. And when it comes down to it, the only difference between Comstock and Fitzroy is how you spell the name. What sort of man was this reality's Booker DeWitt? What was he actually like? Well, luckily, he recorded an audio diary before hey. his demise. So we get to hear from alternate reality Booker. Uh, and he says, looks like I got a friend in town after all. Slate. He's fell in with these Vox Populi, and for irregulars, I will say, they are loaded for bear. Problem is, I gotta help them with their damn revolution first. Then we take Comstock House by storm. I do that, I get the girl. So, he didn't do it because he believed in the cause, this booker. He did it because they could help him get to, uh, Elizabeth. So, for the exact same reason, he's, all, he's doing it in his current yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. But quite literally, yeah. Yeah. So, again, the idea that Elizabeth's like, you're a hero, you, you helped these people. No, he didn't. He wasn't a good man. He was a hero in one way, but... In sense, he, helped like, the, he helped the people, but for... for selfish ends. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, of course, it seems like this reality's Fitzroy doesn't have any need of Chen Lin or his weapons. So, you know, the gunsmith is dead as well in this reality, but the revolution is going full steam. Uh, so, Booker's like, okay, new plan. We go to Fink Factory, that's where Fitzroy's headed, which means that's where the airship will be. But as our duo fight through Fink Factory, inadvertently helping Fitzroy's revolution by killing Comstock and Fink's men, they attract the, the attention of Daisy directly. And that's where she's on an airship and she's projecting her face uh, out the side of it. And she goes, I saw you die, Booker. Saw you die with my own eyes. And Booker's like, Fitzroy, listen, I got you your guns and I'm here for my airship. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously she doesn't need the guns. Yeah. Um, but she's not listening. She sounds kind of rattled by the fact that we're here. And she goes, my Booker DeWitt died for the Vox Populi. You're either an imposter or a ghost. My Booker DeWitt was a hero to the cause, a story to tell your children. You, whatever you are, you just complicate the narrative. So reaching the top of the factory, at, at this point, the Vox turn on Booker and Elizabeth. So now we're fighting Comstock men and Vox Populi at the same time. We get to the top of the factory and Booker and Elizabeth come to a standstill as they watch Daisy Fitzroy shoot Jeremiah Fink in the head. She stands behind bulletproof glass, classic. She dips her hand into Fink's blood and oh. smears it across her face. Okay. She then grabs a young boy, Jeremiah Fink's son, and puts a gun to his head. Booker approaches the glass and he says, Is this it? Is this your movement, Daisy? This is what needs to be done, Fitzroy shouts back. You see, the founders, they ain't nothing but weeds. Cut them down and they just grow back. And then she cocks her gun. If you want to get rid of a weed, you've got to pull it up from the root. It's the only way to... And then she stops. Her eyes widen and a pair of sharp scissors burst through her chest. What? She falls to the ground and bleeds out in seconds, dead. 
Elizabeth stands over her body, holding the scissors in her bloodied hand. Hi, Elizabeth. Looking at what she's done. I guess it runs in the family, she whispers. Booker reaches out to comfort her, but Elizabeth recoils, a manic terror in her eyes, before fleeing onto the airship. Booker goes after her, but she locks herself in one of the airship's rooms and refuses to come out. Booker sighs, goes to the ship's controls, and puts in the coordinates. 78 west by 364 east. Paris. Aww. As the airship takes off, he turns to see Elizabeth. This is all she had, she mutters, staring at the ground. She's cut her hair short, her white blouse and grey skirt are gone. Instead is a corset, a dress, and a blue jacket. It's the outfit of the First Lady. This is the First Lady airship, so inside is one of her outfits, like on a mannequin. She's taken that and cut her hair short. Huh. So before we continue, again, two for the sake of flagging to you, Chase. This really is the moment when people say that the game messes up its politics altogether. Daisy Fitzroy puts a gun to a little boy's head and tries to kill him. Elizabeth then needs to kill Daisy Fitzroy. Um, yeah, I'm on the fence because on one, I can see both sides. Mm. I can see both sides where this just, it does feel very classic fictional revolution narrative. Yeah. You know, it feels like coin in the Hunger Games, for example. I would argue, and many people agree with me, that this is the point, quite literally, this is the point of no return. Bioshock Infinite is no longer interested in talking about racism. It's no longer interested in talking about patriotic, um, religious patriotism or nationalism. It's going to start talking about other shit that we haven't covered yet. Oh. I think it's messy. I think it's clumsy. Aside entirely from the, you know, white guy talking about this thing, just talking about it purely from a narrative standpoint. Ken Levine has made an interesting quote about this where he's defended the decision to do this. Um, where, where, and take everything he says with a pinch of salt because when we get to burial at sea, my feelings on this will change so much, and I won't tell you why right now. Okay. But his takeaway is revolutions are messy. The point, like, basically, what do you expect? Are you expecting a narrative where Daisy Fitzroy kicks Comstock out of a tower and and turns Columbia into utopia? That's not how it works. As we saw with Red Dead Redemption, revolutions are messy, and every kind of historic revolution that this has been based on in some way or another that is analogous with this is also messy as hell. Um, yeah. But the problem that people look at this and go is white Disney princess killed black revolutionary leader to further her own characterization. Yeah, I can Which see is where I the can, real problem lies. I can see that. Yeah. Okay. That's that's fair. So yeah, we're gonna move on. I just I, again, we, we can't cover this without acknowledging that this really is the moment where a lot of people went fuck this game. Um, and this is it. This is the moment. So okay. we're, we're going to continue. Um, so Elizabeth is now dressed in her mother's clothes. She's had a little breakdown. She's cut her hair off. Cover right. What's that? This is her outfit on the cover. This is her outfit on the cover. This is the outfit we know her as, yeah. Um, so, yeah. This um, is also her looking, again, so much like What's-Her-Name from Bioshock 2. Oh, she does look a lot like she Eleanor now. She looks so yeah. much like Eleanor now. Yeah. Like, to the point where I could see that being the same model. Yeah, um, and, and so she goes like, this is all they had. Head cannon. She escapes Columbia and is used in the founding of... <laughs> I think Eleanor was about six when, when she... And, nope, and she was there the whole time. Never ate... Because remember, she was a little sister, so she didn't have to age. Right. Obviously. Okay. Duh. No. <laughs> so she's like, this is all they had. And Booker goes, listen. But she interrupts and she goes, how do you do it? Forget. How do you wash away the things that you've done? And Booker just goes, you don't. You just learn to live with it. The airship doesn't get far, classic. On it is a mechanical Comstock statue. Its eyes light up, the high-pitched Colombian anthem plays, and somewhere in the clouds outside, we hear Songbird's familiar shriek. I was, I was literally about to say that we never dealt with the bird. He smashes into the airship, embeds his talons, and flips it upside down. Oh, what a king. For a moment, Elizabeth Whee! and Booker fly upside down. Everything seems peaceful as things fall into slow motion. Just that brief moment of peace. And then with a hard smack, Booker hits his head, and classic, everything goes dark. God, Booker doesn't know how to do a chapter transition without passing out or drowning. Uh, quite literally, yeah, yeah. So, part five, Lady Comstock. She alive? The airship is a wreck, having crash-landed in Columbia's shopping district, Emporia, so we are still in reality three. Mm -hmm. As Booker and Elizabeth clamber out, they hear a couple of familiar voices. Now, 
I would like to... You haven't picked up on it, so I'm just going to point out a plot hole for you. Um, why is Songbird coming after Booker and Elizabeth? Because surely this reality has an Elizabeth. I'm assuming Songbird's not coming after them. Songbird's just coming after the first ladies. No, he comes after... Songbird's thing is Elizabeth. He goes after Elizabeth. Oh. Yeah. He's... Her Maybe he tracks biomarkers. Mm. So anyway, just just wanted to acknowledge that. Anyway, so um, as Booker and Elizabeth clamber out with the, the airship, they're fine. Uh, they hear a couple of familiar voices and an awkward sound of piano playing. Somehow they've managed to get a piano here and seem to be trying to find the tune. No. <laughs> I love them so much. It's the Lutesses. They're back. So the man goes, "No, that's not it," and. Ro Rosalind is like, it certainly is, isn't, is. Stop it, Elizabeth shouts at him. Stop, you don't know what you're doing. He'll come back. The notes were correct, but the instrument is not, Rosalind says. But if you know how to sing to him, he will take you where you need to go, the man says, handing Booker a card with Songbird Defense System written on it. Who are you, Elizabeth asks. We are where we're needed, Rosalind says. And needed where we are, the man adds. And in the blink of an eye, they're gone. <laughs> so, they're, yeah, they're doing their thing. So we spend quite a bit of time in Emporia, and it's the most open part of the game, full of exposition. So I'm going to dispense Ooh. with any dramatic flair and just get to the point. Perfect. Booker and Elizabeth decide to go to Comstock House, but to get in, they need the fingerprints of either Comstock or his wife. So they go to a nearby graveyard, planning to dig up his dead wife, the First Lady. I'm sorry, what? As they journey on, Booker asks Elizabeth what Seth, the deal is. Seth, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 it feels very Seth from Red Dead. So Booker asks Elizabeth what the deals with Songbird as they go, and she says, When I was younger, I used to be excited by the song that brought Songbird. He was all I had. He fed me, brought me books. He was my friend. Songbird, I love you. Caca! <laughs> <laughs> So, but again, yeah, her only friend in the whole wide world. And she says, and then I grew up. Then I hated him because he was my warden. But he's just Comstock's pet, isn't he? Just like me. I feel like we've not seen a lot of Comstock in like the past two chapters. You haven't, no. No, I'm, and I'm not cutting stuff out. Like, anytime he's popped up, I've put it in this. Oh, to be fair, Lamb, we don't see for like two, three chapters, as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, you're right. Lamb just kind of keeps popping up, like, occasionally to say, like, a couple. I found a lot of audio logs by Lamb to read to you. And there's not mm -hmm. many by Comstock, like, really not many at all. Um, like, five or six tops. Um, so, anyway, so uh, as we explore, we see a board with scalps. Oh! The scalps of Columbia's various founders nailed to it. And next to it is an audio diary. Preston Downs's audio diary, the mercenary Ugh. who was sent after Fitzroy. So uh, you'll see some names here. Fink, Comstock's is blank. Uh, Saltonstall is here somewhere, who's the guy who I told you about from the cut content. So he's found the founders in this reality and he's scalped them. So in this reality, he's not working for Comstock. He's, mm. yeah. He's got an audio diary and he says, Mr. Comstock, when we next meet, it won't be the parley. See, I went out of that uh, hall of heroes to scalp your false shepherd for you. Turns out, though, DeWitt speaks Sue. He helped me swap words with this injured child I've been uh, looking after. Mm. Oh, so they so they did bring back the fact that he's part Native American. In this reality, uh, Preston Downs also had the Sue child whose leg got well, No, 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 I was, I was on about the fact that you said that they never did anything with the Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you're right. In this, this reality's booker, before he became a martyr, did help Preston and, and spoke Sue. You're right, mm. yeah. Uh, but again, it's not a plot point, really. It's just here. I see. Um, so, yeah, so he helped me uh, swap words with this injured child I've been uh, looking after. Now, after hearing how the kid has fared in your city, I'm thinking, when we take your pelt, I'm going to let him hold the knife. Oof. So he became friends with the kid he injured and started to sympathize. Now he started to look at the world in a different way. And he was like, right, we're coming for you, Comstock. Unfortunately, that is the last we hear from Press and Doubt. We don't find his body. We don't know what happened to him. Pe oh. People thought he might be DLC. I think he's cut content, to be frank. I thought there was going to be a confrontation or a meet up with him. We never see him again. Odd. So on a cable car passing closer to the graveyard, we see the Lutesses again. <laughs> Juggling, playing baseball, magically teleporting from platform to platform. They're the best character in the entirety of Bioshock. They absolutely are. People love the Lutesses. Um, so yeah, uh, as we watch them, Elizabeth has a revelation and she goes, I just realized who those two are. They, well, at least she invented the technology that allows Columbia to float. 
And Booker's like, giant balloons. And Elizabeth's like, no, quantum particles suspended in space-time at a fixed height. But the thing is, my book said they disappeared years ago. Something tells me they're not exactly what they appear. They seem to want to help. They're ghosts. And Booker's like, they seem to be out of their minds. <sighs> Through collectibles, we learn that the man, Robert Lutess, one day just appeared in Columbia. As, oh. if, as if Rosalind smuggled him in somehow. <laughs> He's her brother, her twin in fact, and together they were investigating scientific marvels that would shake Columbia's very foundations. But as we keep exploring, Songbird flies by. It's scanning Emporia Forest, desperately trying to find Elizabeth. Booker and Elizabeth are able to hide from it, but when it eventually flies away, Elizabeth is shaken by his presence. There's a beat, and then she looks at Booker and she says, Promise me, I will stop him. No, that is an oath you cannot keep. She takes Booker's hand and places it around her neck. Oh! Promise me that if it comes to it, you will not let him take me back. I won't let it come to that, Booker says. They make it to the graveyard and enter the First Lady Memorial. I won't let it come to that. I need you to pay off my debt. <laughs> they so won't take a corpse. Elizabeth uh, looks at her mother, who is inside a coffin. So uh, Elizabeth's like, how are you, mother? All locked up in there, huh? Looks like you and I have some common ground. But of course, Comstock's booby-drapped to the memorial. He locks them in and speaks over the speakers, and he says, See, child, you have chosen to follow a false shepherd, and he has led you astray. A whirring mechanical machine activates, and suddenly it seems like he's siphoning the energy from Elizabeth. What I do, I do for love! And she's screaming in pain over it. And he goes, What lion does not cringe to see their cub in pain? But spare the rod, spoil the child. If you won't listen to me, perhaps you will listen to your mother! Boom. A ghost bursts out of Lady Comstock's corpse and leers over Booker and Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Sure. sure. She she screams in Elizabeth's face and flies off. <laughs> what? Elizabeth Booker's like Elizabeth. Why is your mother a ghost? <laughs> uh, yeah. And Elizabeth's like she she isn't. He used me to open up some kind of tear. Q, bo Q boss fight with Lady Comstock's ghost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we defeat her. She's when are we fighting the bird? Uh, Is the, the bird going to be like a final boss? Well, I don't know. The bird keeps popping up. It seems like a big deal. Like We're going to have to maybe fight it soon. When are we I getting back to reality one? Mm. Oh, no. Fuck reality one. It's all re reality three. <laughs> Still reality three. Best one. Why is your mother a ghost? Uh, we defeat Lady Comstock in a boss fight, um, but we don't kill her. She just rushes off somewhere deeper into Emporia. Sure. And Booker's like, what is she? And Elizabeth's like, I don't know. And she's all flabbergasted. She doesn't know what to do. And she's like, what am I? And Booker's like, what is she? Alive or dead? And of course, the Lutest twins <laughs> are here with an answer. Yay! It's all a matter of perspective. They're cheerily digging two graves. One for him, one for her. <laughs> <laughs> do you think they're digging their other, the, the other one's grave? Uh, oh, yeah, almost certainly. They, they yeah. wouldn't be digging their own. So Robert goes, uh, why do you ask what, when the delicious question is when? <laughs> the only difference between past and present is semantics. Lives, lived, will live. Dies, died, will die. If we could perceive time as it truly was, what reason would grammar professors have to get out of bed? You know what I think? Mm -hmm. And mayhaps this is headcanon. I doubt this can be confirmed. I think that original Lutess, at least Reality 1 original Lutess, uh, somehow brought Reality 2 Lutess from a tear and that it's just in another tear they happen to be a guy sure yeah um, head cannon that like head like cannon it. away yeah i like that a lot so um yeah so you know liz lived will live dies died will die um and and they continue and rosalind says like us all lady comstock exists across time she is both alive and dead now she perceives being both she finds this condition disagreeable she goes to unfinished business. Three truths you must discover. Three truths that, in this world, Comstock has destroyed. If only one of you had the power to alter time and space, Rosalind says. And then Robert gasps and goes, oh, That would be a blessing, wouldn't it? 
Hollywood. So what are the three truths we need to learn? Well, we follow Lady Comstock's ghost all over the city, battling her. She, by the way, she raises things from the dead. She's got that power for whatever reason. Um, and the truths are laid out for us in audio diaries and tears. So I'm just going to take you through. Uh -huh. Truth one. We discover truth one in Rosalind Lutess's laboratory. There's a contraption here sparking lifelessly. It looks like it exploded. And we hear coming out of the tear, Lady Comstock screaming, You whore! And then, and then Lutes goes, I assure you, madam, my sexual interest in your dear prophet is non-existent. Furthermore, the man is quite sterile. Huh. Yeah, that's, a, that's another suspicious... <laughs> Lady Comstock is like, that's a lie! Come and get your little bastard! I want her out of my house! An audio diary explains more. Audio diary by Lutes, and she says... Lady Comstock seems to believe that the child came from an errant act of carnality between myself and her beloved prophet. I love the way she words it. <laughs> I told the poor woman the truth, that the child was a product of our little contraption. Comstock seems to have been made sterile from exposure to said contraption. Truth two is in Columbia's bank. Coming out of the tear, we hear Jeremiah- Do, do we know what the contraption is? Nope, it's just a contraption. This is the contraption. It's a big metal thing with orbs. Is uh, there a tear in the middle? There's a tear in the middle of it. Are we to assume that it made the tear? I don't know. Maybe. So, truth two is in Columbia's bank. Um, we hear Jeremiah Fink's voice coming out of the tear where he says, And if I do this, Jeremiah Fink says, This sabotage, all of their patents, all of them, Mr. Fink, a henchman working for Comstock says. Now, why does the prophet want these two killed? The same reason Lady Comstock now lies buried. The child. And why does he want me to do it? Because only you can make it seem like an accident. And then an audio log recorded by Comstock. The Archangel tells me that Columbia will only survive so long as my line sits the throne. Yet Lady Comstock produces no child. I have done what a man can do and yet there is no child. I asked Lutess about the matter, but even she refuses to help. And finally, truth three, we find in a photography shop. But... You two are dead, the owner of the shop says, his voice coming out of a tear. I took your funeral photo. Yes, Rosalind Lutess replies, and made an absolute hash of it. One does not expect a picture of one's corpse to come across so lifelessly, Robert adds. And an audio log between the owner and his wife the day after. This is his wife speaking, and his wife says, That's insanity. What proof would you have that Mr. Fink would hurt the Lutesses? The Lutesses told me. Rupert, the wife says, They've been dead for seven days. So, Comstock, to explain in plain terms, murdered the first lady. Then he had the Lutesses killed. Elizabeth is not his daughter. A whole host of audio logs recorded by Rosalind Lutess document this further, and I've combined them for the sake of ease, because it basically is like Lutess lays out what's going on. Lutess did a lore dump. Art by Nika Awir. That makes her look even more like Belle. Oh my god, look at Belle. Mm, that's a really young uh, Elizabeth painting her, her Paris thing, and that's Robert and Rosalind monitoring her. And Rosalind says, What Comstock failed to understand is that our contraption is a window, not into prophecy, but probability. But his money means the Lutess field could become the Lutess tear, a window between worlds. A window through which you and I might finally be together. Brother. Was I right? You were right. Robert kind is of. Robert is Rosalind from another world. <gasps> Go me! Good job. Go you. Go me! So then another one from her and she's, where she says, You have been transfused, brother, into a new reality, but your body rejects the cognitive dissonance through confusion and hemorrhage. But we are together and I will mend you. For what separates us now but a single chromosome? Then, Comstock has sabotaged our contraption, yet... We are not dead. A theory. We are scattered amongst the possibility space. But my brother and I are together, and so I am content. He is not. The business with the girl lies unresolved. But perhaps there is one who can finish it in our stead. And finally, my brother has presented me with an ultimatum. If we do not send the girl back from where we brought her, he and I must part. Where he sees an empty page, I see King Lear. But he is my brother, so I shall play my part, knowing it shall all end in tears. Any theories as to what, what, what's going on here, what the deal is? I'm going to guess that because he was brought over, he has a better understanding that that fucks people. I think that they got her from a different reality as well. Okay. 
Uh, whose daughter she is, not a clue, but I think that she's just from a different reality. Um, and I think that he's like, she's like, oh, look, we did it twice. This is great. And he's like, yeah, but that's, that's fucky. This is, this is not good. Yeah. Let's put her back. I think what's important to note is, um, the inference is that Robert is raging that Comsoc tried to kill them. Or did, he did kill them and blew them into space time, basically. That's how they have the ability just to disappear at will. Yeah. And Robert could, he, he wanted revenge. Rosalind just wanted to keep doing the experiments and keep living as she was. Uh, he seems quite content these days. So with these three truths learned, we confront Lady Comstock one last time. We battle her outside Comstock house, the fight is tough, but eventually, as her ghost shimmers with rage, Elizabeth steps forward. I owe you an apology, she screams. Comstock used me to bring you back, but I brought you back from a reality that I built up in my own head. He pretended to love you, as he pretended to love me. I am not your husband's bastard. I am his victim. We must forgive each other because there's one far worse. So she says that she brought her back from a reality that she built up in her own head. From Paris. I just don't know what that means. Doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think that's how multiverses work, but whatever. She can create new multiverses. Apparently. She continues and she says, you're not of this world, but maybe this is you in another world where you never meet him. And Lady Comstock's ghost says, Or where I saved him? And Elizabeth goes, I don't know. Is that even possible? Find out, child, the ghost says. Find out. And then explodes in a ball of light, bursting down the door to Comstock House. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. <laughs> it's ludicrous. Okay. So Booker and Elizabeth march on to Comstock. They're so close now they can what taste it. What the f fuck are we looking at? His home is a mansion, a castle, a floating island in itself with the faces of Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin, almost like the, um... Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore, thank you. Yeah, almost like Mount Rushmore. Uh, but as they reach the cable car, Songbird arrives one more time. It knocks Booker out, and when he comes to... <laughs> <laughs> Booker's got a fucking glass jaw. He's just... Well, he needed to lock that. How else would we get to the next chapter? Yeah, yeah. There's no other way. That's the only way he knows. When he's leaving to go for work in the morning, he hits himself <laughs> over the head. <laughs> when he comes to, he's back in his old office again. The, the black and white office of back in the day. The Latest twins stand there and say in unison... Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. And then whoosh. It was them. Maybe, look, he's just been hit on the head. We come to, and then whoosh, he comes to. Songbird leers down in him, claw raised, ready to finish this, to cleave him apart. And then Elizabeth steps into shot. Stop it, she screams. Please don't hurt him. Just don't take, we're still in uh, reality three, right? Reality three, cool. reality three. Stop it, she screams. Please don't hurt him. And Songbird... Uh, just moves her to the side with his massive paw. He just like moves her out of the way. He's like, yeah, no, 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 no thank you, please. I'm busy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Sorry, sweetie. Let daddy do his work. Raises claw back in the air, but is stopped in his tracks by two simple words. I'm sorry, Elizabeth says. I never should have left. Please don't hurt him. Take me back. Take me home. Please? Songbird hesitates, but picks her up with one hand. And Booker watches dazed as it carries Elizabeth into the night. Her, her hand like reaches for him almost as one final, is there a way out of this? No, I've had to, I've made my choice to save you. Ele uh, Booker gets to his feet and he goes, Elizabeth! And he tries to follow. An electrical storm seems to be building outside. Come after me all you want, Booker says. We can hear Songbird flying away screeching. I'm not letting you take her, you hear me? Huh? You feather piece of shit. I'm not gonna. But his words falter as he emerges through the whirling clouds and sees what's waiting for him. Part 6, Comstock House. Snow. Comstock House is covered in snow. What is this? It's July, Booker mutters. For a brief second, a tear opens up by him. He hears Elizabeth's voice. She's speaking to someone. Get your hands off me, she screams. Just take me back to my tower, please. The main hall is bizarre. Did they destroy her tower? In reality one. In reality one, yeah, we don't know what it's like in this reality. Also, oh, where's the re Elizabeth from this reality? The main hall is exactly where is Elizabeth in this reality? The main hall is bizarre and strange. A humongous statue of Elizabeth bearing a sword in the center. Elizabeth Comstock, the words say. God speed thy judgment. I think I found where she is. Ooh. Candles cover the floor, lighting the halls, and we hear her voice over the tano tannoys, sounding cold and hard. My father dreamt of fire, she says. We were given Eden, but we turned it into Sodom. 
Why do we deserve salvation? The Lord gave Noah a fish in the form of a flood, but he was not so easy on me. He said, Prophet, I want you to train a nation of fishermen. As we work our way up the tower, more and more tears leak through with the voice of a scared and crying Elizabeth. What is this place? She says. You're sick, child, Comstock's voice replies. Not of body, but of spirit. DeWitt has left you here. You should give up on him. It's been six months. Mindless beings wander the halls, wearing masks of the Founding Fathers. They seem to be temporally displaced, the same way Chan Lin was back in Finkton. The creatures that aren't temporally displaced are wearing odd metal helmets with huge horns sticking out of the sides. These are known as the Boys of Silence. What? The whole house screams authoritarianism. Even the architecture is brutal as to double down on the harshness of whatever the hell is going on here. Audiologues tell us more. The first is by Comstock's chief surgeon, Harrison Powell, telling us what they did to Elizabeth in this reality. The procedure should help immensely with the uh, issues we've had with the girl. Once the device is implanted, any effort on her part to alter the state of things will emit a mostly painful electric shock. Pavlov made a dog salivate. We'll make this one weep. And it seems like these efforts worked because now Elizabeth is quoting scripture and following in Comstock's footsteps. Uh. Diary one by Elizabeth. Our minds are born festering with sin. Some are so blighted, they will never find redemption. The mind must be pulled up from the roots. My chip, Daisy Fitzroy, if you're gonna get rid of a weed, pull it up from the roots. Now she's saying the mind must be pulled up from the roots. My children are without blame, without fault, and without choice. For what is the value of will when the spirit is found wanting? But then it seems like as time went on, she started to have regrets, perhaps, about becoming the new Comstock of this world. Diary 2. Tomorrow, the leash comes off. Because all of this, it has to end. But even if I destroy the siphon, will I be strong enough to see all the doors and open whichever I choose? And if I bring him here, who is to say that he would be any match for the monsters I have created? What I've done cannot be undone. I cannot stop what I have put in motion, but perhaps I can keep it from ever starting. He was my first hope, and now he is my last. So what's going on? Well, at the top of Comstock Tower, we see for ourselves. As you can see, Booker, a shape moves into view at the top of the stairs, Elizabeth. The lunatics are running the asylum. They don't even listen to me anymore. All I can do is watch as what I set into motion slides into its terminal stage. It took all I have left in me just to bring you here. I don't understand, Booker says. Take my hand, Elizabeth says, reaching out to him, and we see, first, that Elizabeth is old. Very old. She's pulled us into the future, a future where Comstock and his surgeons brainwashed her, untapped her potential, unlocked the doors, and let her control the tears. But that brainwashing and that power led to Comstock's prophecy coming true. Behind Elizabeth is New York. Colombian airships rain fire down from the sky. Pillars of smoke billow from apartment buildings. This is obviously what Booker saw uh, when he got baptised at the very beginning of the game as a brief moment before he came to. Mm. It's all getting a bit loopy now. The seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Say what you will about Comstock. He was a hell of a fortune teller. It wasn't the torture that broke me. It wasn't even the indoctrination. It was time. Time rots everything. Even hope. I was coming, Booker says. Songbird, Elizabeth cuts him off. Always stops you. It's too late for me. I brought you here for your sake. Yours and hers. Here. She hands us a card. It's for her. She'll know how to read it. What does it say? It's advice. Advice for what? How not to become me. Whoosh! She opens a tear and pushes Booker through. Back to 1912. Right after Elizabeth was taken. Old Elizabeth. Back to reality one, question mark? We don't know. My inf- uh, my inference is this is reality three again. But we honestly do not know. Okay. Um, because in rea- the end of the reality three, Elizabeth was taken by Songbird off to Comstock Tower to be tortured. And she's, this, she's being tortured when we find her. Songbird is nowhere to, to be seen, 
Um, she snuck him in. So again, basically, she's like, every time Songbird stops you, so almost like, I've brought you here, and now sent you through another gate is like a shortcut, so Songbird doesn't stop you, so you get there in time. In the next room, we hear Elizabeth screaming. screaming. Booker rushes in and sees the surgeons poking her with needles. Comstock stands on a balcony above, watching. Mr. DeWitt, he says, what's the expression? Day late and a dollar short? But Booker doesn't need money, he just needs bullets. So he guns down the guards, pulls some levers, <laughs> and turns off to uh, Comstock's siphon. Uh, the one thing that was holding back Elizabeth's powers. A supercharge of energy blasts into her, powering her up, and she opens a tear into somewhere on Earth. Somewhere where a tornado is tearing through it. It rips through the lab, ripping the surgeon's limb from limb. Comstock gets away, but Elizabeth is safe for now. Yeah. I guess? Booker unhooks her from the machine and hands her the card. I think someone meant for you to have this, he says. It's written by me, she says. In a flash, she understands everything. She doesn't need Booker to explain. Let's get out of here, Booker says. Let's get an airship and get to Paris. No, Elizabeth says. We're not leaving. We're going to find Comstock. You saw what he turns me into. I will not allow that. So what? You're going to kill him? Booker says, exasperated. A beat. Is this where you start moralizing, Booker? You forget I know you. I'm not going to let you kill him. Really, Booker? A flash, a tear opens. We see that tornado whirling in the distance, an awesome display of her power. And what are you going to do to stop me? Nothing, he says, because I'm going to do it for you. Final part. Always a lighthouse. <laughs> Fuck's sake. We started and ended with one. Booker and Elizabeth fight their way onto Comstock's flagship, where he patiently waits. Neil has a big grin on his face right now because he knows what's about to happen, and Chase is so confused. Oh, do you? Yeah, I've played this game. <laughs> oh, shit, so you have. Oh, why, why do you think I haven't been suggesting opinions or, or like... Uh... I've also just realized we've not made a choice in... Eons. Uh, Do those choices actually mean anything? No more choices. We, we're not talking about since like chapter three. Yeah, no more choices now. Okay. Yeah. Do they mean anything? Well, you'll find out. Okay. Anyway, Booker and Elizabeth fight their way onto Comstock's flagship where he patiently waits. Blood spatters the concrete on the way. Both Elizabeth and Booker are getting their hands dirty now. So, wait, 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 wait. They're both getting their hands <laughs> I dirty. I knew you wouldn't get away with that. He, he went this whole big speech of, no, I'm not gonna let you kill him. You can't get your hands any bloodier. Killing your father but, is like, different. Killing, so yeah, just kill a whole shitload of innocents instead okay. of just one... E you know the word. Thingy, big maniac, man. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can't kill him. You can't She's kill not... the objectively okay. evil person, but you can kill a bunch of fodder. No, it's, that's my bad. She's not shooting anybody. She is using tears to bring through, like, security bots that gun them down, or Gatling that's guns. That's not better! Well, I'm just saying that she's not... That's just using a different weapon! She's not pulling the trigger, she's just summoning the guns. <laughs> that, you, that, that, get out of here, you semantics lawyer. That's the same thing. So, anyway, so Elizabeth, in a moment of quiet, she says, Do you think it's a. Do also, you think, yes. That corset looks. <laughs> not even got to Comstock. Yeah. Just in this particular shot, that corset looks really uncomfortable. It looks like it's too tight. It's yeah. cutting into her ribs. Yeah. Please, gal, let it out. Yeah. Uh, you can't move like that. You can't breathe. It's yeah. going to be painful. It's going to squish your ribs. That's so all. Elizabeth is like... Dude. Also, I was saying off camera. <laughs> I was saying off camera, but I'll say it again on here. The most impressive thing of this entire game so far is the fact that uh, Elizabeth was able to, on her own, get into a course of that size mm -hmm. in, like, five minutes. Like, that would take centuries, even with another person helping lace you up. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I'll just do it. Do it myself. Look at each play. Anything else? Easy, easy. Anything else on the course? Um... I, th I think it's weird that it's pinching right below the bust and at the waist, not just at the waist, but, you know, I feel like that's just probably game design accentuating titties for the sake of game design. So, cool. I guess. I don't know. Like, it's not a particularly... Oh, for fuck's sake, don't join in. It's not generically how course it's work. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think this is a very sexualized image of her. It's just, oh, I, 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 like, did, I didn't mean it for yeah. that sake. I just meant generic video game design. Yeah. Anyway, so, Elizabeth... Sorry, please continue. <laughs> So Elizabeth turns to Booker and she says, Do you think it's possible to redeem the kind of things that we've done? 
And no. Booker's like, Booker's like, redeem? I don't see much use in that. And Elizabeth says, Booker, are you afraid of God? And Booker says, no, but I'm afraid of you. Outside Comstock's office, we see a mural. A mural that shows the entirety of Booker and Elizabeth's adventure up until now. Fighting like, Slate. Across realities? Yep. Fighting Slate in the Hall of Heroes. Elizabeth killing Daisy Fitzroy. Flitting through realities. Comstock predicted all of this. In the center of the mural is a model of Elizabeth's tower. And we see that in the base of it was a massive siphon. It seems like it was set up to draw energy from her, a leash to control her powers. When I was little, I used to be able to not just open tears, but create new ones to anywhere I wanted to go. But then- So the exact thing I said that she could do and you know, no, she can't do that. She can't do it because she says, but then the tower and her voice trails up. She lost that ability. The tower has stopped that ability. It is a siphon. Mm. So Elizabeth's voice trails off and she starts to march towards the door to Comstock's office, like anger on her face. And Booker says, stand back, I'm ending this. And she goes, no, this is between me and him. Comstock stands in his own personal garden. Above him is a stained glass window of Elizabeth surrounded by doting Columbians. A fountain sits in the middle of the room. Come here, child, Comstock says. Well, come on, I <laughs> don't bite. My, oh my, how you've grown. Look at you, you're... Oh, you're a mess. And he pulls a sponge out of the fountain and gently washes the blood from Elizabeth's hands. Hey, Booker says, let go of her. But Comstock ignores him. <laughs> Everything I've done, I've done to keep you safe. He continues to Elizabeth. The archangel revealed it to me. Beware, prophet, she said. Beware the false shepherd Booker DeWitt, for he shall be as a wall between her and destiny. Quick, hot second. Mm -hmm. I think that the archangel is mm -hmm. gonna end up being scientist twins. Okay, I will just tell you this because um, you're not gonna get any more information and it's kind of been said to us. Not the twins, the machine. The machine, we know that Comstock had prophetic visions. They, they were tears in reality. And the Lutess has created the machine that created the tears. So he looked into them and glimpsed bits of the future. Was he not leading Columbia prior to Lutet? Or did that all happen down well, before? Well, he, uh, was he, was, he was a fraud before and then he got visions. You know? Uh -huh. Yeah, like, he, he, was a, he pretended, but then he got powers, I guess. Sure. But the tears are his visions. So everything he has seen, he has seen just through tears. It's what Lutes says uh, during the truths. Um, and, but through being exposed to those tears... Um, he has developed a brain tumor, basically. Uh, and he's also become sterile. That's all because he's been overusing the tear machine to get his visions. He finally turns his attention to us and he says, Do it, I've been a fool. I've sent mighty armies to stop you. I've rained fire on you from above. I did all of that to keep you from her when all I needed to do was tell her the truth. Ask him, child, he says to Elizabeth. Ask him what happened to your finger. Ask DeWitt. He grabs her hand, but Elizabeth tries to pull back. Does DeWitt know this? He grabs her hand, but Elizabeth tries to pull it back. He wrestles with her for a second, trying to take the thimble off of her pinky, and Booker sees red. We don't control this. She's your daughter, you son of a bitch, he snarls, choking at Comstock. And you abandoned her! He slams Comstock's head on the edge of the fountain. Was it worth it? Huh? Did you get what you wanted? He slams his head again, blood pops out of it, and he goes, Tell me! Tell me! And Comstock chuckles weakly as Booker throttles the life from him. It is finished, he gasps. I hate Jesus. Not yes, exactly. Nothing is finished, Booker shouts, and smashes Comstock's face into the fountain, drowning him. You lock her up her whole life, cut off her finger, and you put that on me? Yeah, baptize her. Elizabeth screams at him, yeah. and he's, she's like, Booker, stop! But he doesn't listen. He drowns Comstock, and the prophet dies. Okay. A beat. What did he mean? Elizabeth asks. You tell me, what what did he mean about my finger? And B Booker, Booker's like calming himself down, he's breathing heavily, he goes, I don't know, I, I don't know, I, I assumed you were born with it. Your nose, she interrupts, it's bleeding. I Booker like touches the blood and pulls it when we see the blood and he says, I swear to you, I have no idea what he's talking about. 
You do, Elizabeth presses. You just can't remember it. And there's a small kind of curl of disgust on her face as she realises that Booker might not be what she thinks he is. No, Booker says. I'll prove it to you. The siphon. We'll destroy the siphon. The answer's behind one of your doors. We just have to open it. Elizabeth reluctantly agrees, and the two of them come up with a plan. The siphon is inside Monument Island. To destroy the siphon, we need to destroy the island. But the only thing big enough to do that is Songbird. So, sure. with Comstock dead... Oh, sorry. Uh, I just feel really tired now. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just an overwhelming amount of information now. Sorry, this is Booker drowning Comstock. Uh, do, do we ever get any indication as to what AD means? With Comstock dead, they plan to destroy Monument Island. Only thing big enough to do that would be Songbird. Uh, so uh, they managed to activate his song to summon him, but this time it's Elizabeth doing the job, not Comstock. Elizabeth is now who Songbird listens to. Sure. He nuzzles into her for a beat, listens to what she had. <gasps> yep, they pretty much, and uh, he listens to what she has to say, where she basically goes, "I need you to destroy the the monument for me." And then he soars through the air, crashing into Monument Island. And what I will say is, I'm skipping over this, but there's like a big bunch of gameplay where we basically have to fight Vox Populi and Colombians. Sombers flying around, smashing into oh, them. I forgot we were still in the Revolution timeline. <laughs> yeah, I'm skipping over all of it. It's crap. It's a tower defense mission. You were saying before, is Songbird going to be a boss? No, Songbird is an ally. That's the. You think there's going to be a boss fight? No boss fight. Songbird better, helps. better question. Mm. Is Songbird a robot? Or a cyborg? Great question. I don't have an answer for you. Cool. Because it's looking weirdly organic. You will learn For more. being a massive fucking bird. You will learn more about Songbird another day. Uh, not another day, but another episode. What? I'm not going to tell you anymore Excu right now. Excuse me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is Songbird mm -hmm. so important? Mm -hmm. So anyway. It's a um, big fucking bird. Songbird crashes into Monument Island. A huge burst of energy <laughs> spreads out. And Elizabeth draws it all in. The leash is off. She can now see into all the doors. All of the realities. That doesn't seem healthy. But that burst of energy also destroys the machine that controls Songbird. Elizabeth, Booker says, looking out as Songbird turns in the air and starts to fly towards them. Does she have dope ass white hair now? This is temporary. It's just a very cool look. She's glowing. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a very cool look. She lights up. Super Saiyan. Uh, the bird, Elizabeth. I've, I've lost control. Super Sonic. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Golden Sonic. Oh. Super Saiyan Sonic. When he gets the Chaos Emeralds. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just a, not as good, is it? Go Goku sucks, so... He's not a great dad, but he's a great fighter. Elizabeth, Booker says. Elizabeth could want to want him. I'm so sorry, Monty. We're like, we're, we're literally about to do the walk. Would it be this show if we let you get to the end easily? Elizabeth, Booker's, we're coming up to the point where I can tell Neil to order food. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, Booker says, looking out as Songbird turns into the air and starts to fly towards us. The bird, Elizabeth! I've lost control! He's coming! No, Elizabeth says. He isn't. And with a simple swipe <laughs> of her hand, she opens a tear. A tear into rapture. For fuck's sake, sure. This is what Bar was I right? Barry old sees at Rapture, and the just bird's like, gonna be there. I thought you'd enjoy this reveal more. Like uh, I'm just, you, I'm just so tired <laughs> by now. Like, what? Hey, talk, talk me through this because you've gone from being quite into this to, to hating it. To, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say more when we wrap. To be clear, I'm still enjoying it. It's just, it feels like. There, there's not really a lot of logic behind anywhere we're going anymore. It's kind of just going places for the sake of going places. Okay. Like, why why Rapture? Uh, why Rapture for any reason other than, oh, look at the thing we used to have. It's the Nostalgia Berries. It's, it's Nostalgia Berries. Like, yeah. there's no other reason for this to be Rapture. Well, the thought is that we need to kill Songbird. And what better place to kill Songbird than the pressure of the ocean so they can stand inside Rapture, which is uh, safe while they watch this. Oh, so we physically go to Rapture? We are in Rapture. Fuck's sake, sure. we can we can walk around during okay. all of this. I don't think Ken Levine's as clever as everyone wants to make pe make him think he is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, we enter. I Rapture. think he made one good game and then tried to coast on that from then on. This yes. is hot takes. I'm fighting the fan base. Wow. Uh, you're not fighting me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. You're not necessarily fighting me. Um, so they, we go into Rapture. From inside Andrew Ryan's City Beneath the Sea. Booker and Elizabeth watch as Songbird, trapped under the pressure of the ocean, starts to rupture and scream for its life. It's having a burial at sea, isn't it? 
Shh, yeah. Elizabeth says. Placing a hand this is actually glass. a really beautiful moment. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, because bear in mind, her only friend. And all, all Songbird was ever guilty of was caring about Elizabeth. It never wanted to hurt her. It just wanted to keep her away from Booker. Shh, Elizabeth says, placing a hand against the glass. So small compared to Songbird's massive paw. Shh, it's okay. It's all right. I'm here. Just let go. There you go. There you go. Lost beneath the waves, Songbird dies. And as it does, some familiar violins kick in. An instrumental version of Somewhere Beyond the Sea. Not Under the Sea. Boo. You don't like this? No. You don't like There's no good point for it. It's not an Easter egg. It's returning here for no good reason. There. Okay. We'll see how you feel in a bit. So Booker is like, what is this place? Taking in the neon signs of the Welcome Center, the very location where Jack met his first big daddy back in Bioshock 1. It's a doorway, Elizabeth says. One of many. She seems distracted, like she's seeing something that we can't see. Come on! We follow Elizabeth through the ruins of Rapture, down to the bathosphere that Jack docked at the start of his adventure. Oh, so we're literally going back to the Bioshock 1 lighthouse. The pair get in sight. What do you mean this is a doorway? Booker, Booker asks. I'll have to show you, Elizabeth says. Booker pulls a lever, and out into the ocean, the two go in the bathosphere. Did, has she just somehow, the second she got her powers back, internalized all the knowledge of every reality in existence? Is that why she knows how to work a bathosphere? Yes. She can see all the doors. That doesn't seem healthy. One, she can see every single two, reality. The only thing that would redeem this part right now for me is if we were going back up in the bathosphere and we got the entire opening to Bioshock 1 where we're going down and it has like the video and it has the thing, but it's all played in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Booker pulls a lever and out into the ocean, the two go in the bathosphere. Sure. A city at the bottom of the ocean? He smirks. Ridiculous. Yes, it is. <laughs> the bathosphere takes them up far away from Rapture, up to the ocean surface, and when they emerge, we see Rapture's lighthouse. Would you look at that? Elizabeth mutters, looking at the glittering stars in the night sky. Thousands of doors, opening all at oh once. God, I remember this so well. My God, they're beautiful. They exit the bathosphere and head up to the lighthouse entrance, and pushing through the door, they see hundreds of lighthouses. Thousands, millions more stretching off into the infinite. Bioshock infinite, not Bioshock 3. See? Not stars, Elizabeth says. Doors. There are a million, million worlds, all different and all similar. Constants and variables. There's always a lighthouse. There's always a man. There's always a city. I can see them through the doors. You, me, Columbia, Songbird, but sometimes something's different, but the same. Did she just confirm that there will never be a female pro tag to a Bioshock game? This is part of some meta commentary on the Bioshock series. We've had three games now, all three of them have been men, all three of them have been in a city, two didn't have a lighthouse, but you know, the lighthouse takes you to Rapture. This is meant to be the final ever Bioshock game. This, this was designed to be the Bioshock to end all Bioshocks. Everything that's about to happen, aside from also connecting to Bioshock Infinite stuff, is Ken Levine going, don't make any more, we're done. Always a man, always a lighthouse, always a city. They push through another lighthouse. Another million million worlds and lighthouses, except this time the lighthouses are different. They look like the one Booker climbed at the start of Bioshock Infinite. We see other Bookers, other Elizabeths walking their own paths. We don't acknowledge them, and they don't acknowledge us. It's us, Booker says. I don't understand. We swim in different oceans, but land on the same shore. It always starts with a lighthouse. I, I, I still don't understand, Booker says. And she goes, you don't have to. It happens all the same. And Booker's voice breaks, almost like as his mind starts to comprehend what he's looking at. And he says, there's so many choices. They all... There wasn't many choices. There was like four. There's so many choices. <laughs> there was like four? They all lead to the same place. Where it started. No one tells me where to go, Booker growls. <sighs> Booker, Elizabeth says, you've already been... Choices do not have consequences in this game. Cool. They all lead to the same path. There's right. one ending to Bioshock Infinite. Are we just meant to assume that these other ones are where the choices led them? Yes. I picked that a birdcage, so I ended up on that one out in the distance. Yes. For all we know, there's a booker somewhere that threw the ball at the couple. <laughs> you know, it's there's all the choices. All the choices. 
You're not looking very impressed by this. And this is, this is, is, meant to be good? this is the end. This is everything you're about to get here. This is, this is meant to be good though. I really, really love this I ending. I don't. Well, 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 we're not, we're not done. Continue. We're not done. <laughs> yeah, I always like that line, no one tells me where to go. You've already been. Across the ocean we head, following a wooden walkway that opens up in front of us. Through another lighthouse we go. This one leads to a river. We stand, watching a priest as he prays with his flock. I know this place, Booker says. I was here 20 years ago, right after Wounded Knee. I was looking for... And then we hear the priest, and he says, Are you ready to have your past erased? Are you ready to have your sins cleansed? Are you ready to be born again? Take my hand. And he puts his hand out to Booker, and Booker goes, No, no, I don't want to. But you already did, Elizabeth says. Didn't you? But he didn't. A different Booker did. Are you ready to be born again? The priest asks. I am, Booker says, his voice quivering. Jesus, wash this man clean. Father, make him born again. Wait, no, no! Booker pushes off the priest past the flock and they vanish behind him. You didn't go through with it, Elizabeth says. You think a dunk in the river is going to change the things that I've done? Let's get out of here. These, these, these doors of yours, they're all tears, right? Well, open one up. Open one up to Paris. I want to be shot of all of this. Not until we find Comstock, Elizabeth says. He's dead. She pushes open the next door. It's Booker DeWitt's office. He's speaking to Robert Lutess. Mm -hmm. And what of my debts, we hear Booker say. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt, Robert says. This is the man who hired me to find you, Booker says. And then we hear music, a twinkling nursery rhyme kind of music. Booker pushes into the next room where he sees a crib and we hear a baby cooing. Wait, wait, no, this is wrong. What is this? There was, there was no baby. I'd remember. <laughs> no, there was no baby. And if there was, I sure as hell wouldn't give it to this guy. Booker, Elizabeth says gently, you don't leave this room until you do. I can see all the doors. And what's behind all the doors, and behind one of them, I see him. Comstock. So he does. He picks up the baby and hands it to Robert Lutess. The debt's paid, Lutess says. Mr. Comstock washes you of all your sins. Through the door we go once more. This time emerging in the rowing boat from the beginning. This time Elizabeth is sitting with us in the boat. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt, she shouts over the storm. There was no baby, Booker shouts. The deal was, I go to Columbia to get you. I remember what I remember. Oh, now we've upset him, the gentleman says from the beginning. We now recognize the voice as Robert Lutess. I don't expect this next bit is going to do much for his mood, Rosalind says. What are we doing here? Booker asks Elizabeth, ignoring the twins. Comstock's dead. We can just go on with our lives now. Let's just go back to Paris. And Elizabeth is like, dead? You mean like Chen Lin was? Lady Comstock? No, he is alive in a million, million worlds. It's not over because the prophet is dead. It will only be over if he never even lived in the first place. Through another door, an alleyway. We see Robert Lutess standing in front of a tear. Rosalind Lutess is on the other side in her lab in Columbia. A younger Comstock stands next to Robert, clutching the baby. Hey, Booker yells. The deal's off, you hear me? The deal's off, give her back. He grabs Comstock, trying to wrestle the baby from him. Robert leaps into the tear back to Columbia. Comstock tries to follow, but Booker keeps wrestling him. Behind them, the tear starts to close. Eventually, Comstock's able to get into the tear, but Booker grabs his arms, trying to wrestle the baby from him. Give me her back, Booker yells. Anna, I've got you, it's okay. Shut down the machine, Comstock barks at Lutesses. Give me back my daughter, Booker screams. And as he does, time slows. Comstock wrenches the baby back through the tear. Anna reaches out to Booker with a tiny hand. The tear closes. And as it does, it severs her finger. A small part of her left behind in Booker's reality. Booker drops to his knees and sobs. I'm sorry, he says. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Time shifts. He's back in his office. You shared this room with your regret for almost 20 years, Elizabeth says. And then one day, a man came here to you and offered you a chance at redemption. A chance for us to be together. 
A tear opens and we see Robert Lutess standing by a rowing boat. Booker collapses. Rosalind looks at the initials on the back of his hand. Do you suppose he branded himself as some sort of penance? She muses. Oh, it's fucking energy wet. Mm -hmm. Don't see the point. What's done is done. What's done will be done. It is Anna DeWitt. Mm. Booker mumbles nonsensically. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. See, Robert says. He's putting his story together. He's manufacturing new memories from his old ones. The brain adapts. I should know. I lived it. Another door. Back in the rowing boat. I sold you, Booker says to Elizabeth. <coughs> I sold you. To your credit, you did try to weasel out of the deal, Rosalind says. <laughs> They're the best to the end. This is all calm stock, Booker mutters. What if we... What if we go back, kill him before he did any of this? How would one know how far back to go, Robert says. That's the only way to do it, Booker says, his voice hardening. Go back to when he was born and smother the son of the bitch in a crib. We approach the lighthouse one more time. One last time. Booker, Elizabeth says. Are you sure this is what you want? I have to. It's the only way to undo what I've done to you. He steps through the door and returns to the place where he refused that first baptism. Booker DeWitt, the priest says. Are you ready to be born again? Wait, wh what is this, Booker says. Why are we back here? This isn't the same place, Booker, Elizabeth says. Well, of course it is. I remember. Wait a minute. You're... You're not... You're not... Numerous Elizabeths step into shot. Different haircuts, different clothes, Elizabeth that chose the cage, Elizabeth that chose the bird. You chose to walk away, they say. But in other oceans, you didn't. You took the baptism. You were born again as a different man. Comstock, Booker breathes. It all has to end, to have never started, not just in this world, but in all of ours. Smother him in the crib, Booker says. Smother. Elizabeth says, and the echo it back, smother, smother, smother. Before the choice is made, Elizabeth says, before you are reborn, what name will you take, my son, the priest says. He's Zachary Comstock, and Elizabeth says. He's Booker DeWitt, another says. No, I'm both. The Elizabeths push him under the water, and together they baptize him and drown him. Booker's life fades from him, and as he does, we watch as the Elizabeths fade away too. Because you need a bunch of little girls at the end of a Bioshock game. Oh, chills, man. That that line always gets me. Uh, well, I'm both. Uh, yeah, I really like I'm both. And she, she drowns him. And as we watch as the Elizabeths fade away too, one by one, until just one remains. And before she fades, we cut to black. And the credits roll. Okay. There is a post credit scene before you give me your thoughts. Do you want to see the post credit scene? I'd yes, love please. to see the post credit scene. Booker DeWitt sits in his office. We hear a childish jingle in the next room, playing out a nursery rhyme. Anna? He mutters blearily. He opens the door, entering Anna's bedroom. Is that you? And we cut to black. Sure. Talk me through your feelings. Okay. Um to 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 be clear. I know that I've sounded very exasperated and annoyed for the past. It's an exasperating half hour journey. I, the main issue, I so I liked most of the reveals in this ending. Hmm. I hate one. I do hate the entire addition of Rapture and all the lighthouses. I don't think that makes sense. It just it doesn't fit with any theme shown anywhere else in the game. It's out of nowhere. Rapture is there with for nothing other than the hollow callback for the nostalgia berries. Mm -hmm. But everything else in the end, I really like. But I hate that it is all shoved into a cutscene at the end of the game. It's not a cutscene. You are playing through this. You're walking through this. That's fine. I hate that it is all the end of the game and that nothing... It's a lore dumb walk. Nothing prior in the game would have ever led you to even theorize that Comstock was... I've got to disagree with you uh, on yeah, that. No, there are more this, clues this, to this. What? Okay, perfect. Let's did go you, to... Did you cut them or... Were... No, they were all in my script. Um, so Comstock knows everything about Booker. Absolutely everything about Booker. Uh, Booker goes to Wounded Knee. Comstock led Wounded Knee. But everyone claims that Comstock wasn't at Wounded Knee. But Comstock was at Wounded Knee 
knee, he was Booker at Wounded Knee. Okay. Um, there's there's lots of little ones. Every audio diary talking about the, Elizabeth Pinky being in two different realities. We learn about how that could be a problem with the two okay. uh, with Chen Lin. The Ross little Tesses pop up numerous times. Why is B- Booker's nose keeps bleeding? Uh, despite him being in, because he's in a reality with Comstock. So at the beginning, he gets that flash of 1984, the old lady Elizabeth bringing Sodom to the fire below, uh, to the, the fire to the Sodom below. Um, he's getting that vision because he is Comstock, and Comstock's memories are integrating with him. So he's seeing the visions that Comstock got. Okay. Uh, they're very subtle. It's very, look, okay, I think Comstock I, okay. is a very clever review. That's, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I, I still don't necessarily like the pacing at the end, but I like yeah. a lot of the reveals. I will say I one don't even remotely get how this gives final Bioshock. I, I, pure I, final Bioshock. I see zero commentary there. Well, no, the the point um, the point that he's making is that you can't do anything new now. You take this concept, there will always be a man, always a lighthouse, always a city. I, as far as this is, and whether you agree with him or not, because we know I there's don't. a Bioshock Four being made, he's basically saying there are no more new ideas you can do with this concept. They'll all be the same. Give me a communist Bioshock. Give I me agree. a I agree. fascist Bioshock. You, there's agree. so many other ways that yeah. you can take. Sure, it'll always be a man and a city and a lighthouse. Let those just be staples of a series. It's also commentary on choices in video games. Uh, it's almost a little bit like Ken Levine's thinking a little bit about Bioshock 1, the good ending, bad ending, those crap endings. Uh, well, the crap bad ending. Um, I don't know what you mean. A little girl with nukes is great. <laughs> well, he's basically saying, like, you know, in the long run, making choices in video games don't matter because it, everything's predestined anyway by the programmers. Like, the, the programmers predestined, oh, yeah, you're, you make choices, but we give you choice. We decide what the choices mean, you know. It's not really choice making. It's, you don't. A player never has free will in a game. Is the I, argument they're making? And I disagree with that. I don't agree with, yeah, that. I disagree with that. Yeah. Overall, overall, Bioshock Infinite, high six, low seven out of ten. That's interesting. Better um, or worse than two? Better. Okay. You're sitting with the same rating as me. Then I yeah, prefer it, Infinite it's, Story. It's yeah. I think it's just more interesting. Like I, I do feel like playing through this, it'd be a very fun and constantly like on the edge of your seat kind of action game mm-hmm. yes it's it just being lore dumped it i'm kind of like this is exasperating <laughs> yeah. but it's it's very fun I, I i absolutely see what the people who say that that moment in the middle is like the end of the commentary completely oh, dear well, absolutely God. that's, it, that's all I, after Daisy does. that's all i had left to say is that it just abandons um, yeah. uh, any kind of social commentary and yes the quantum mechanics stuff is very interesting um, and I, if they could have held both, I would have been a lot more interesting. Uh, yeah, it's it it, it, it it is still there, but it is set dressing, and and I just want to flag that I didn't show you any, yeah, but it's like, it is still present in there. After Daisy dies, it mm, stops feeling like a Bioshock game to me. It that is interesting. It doesn't feel like a bad game, mm. but it doesn't. It ceases to feel like a Bioshock game in anything other than gameplay. Um, which take that good or bad, I see that neutrally personally, but. I love Infinite for reasons like Elizabeth, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, but it is the weakest as far as it's, even with my problems with Bioshock 2's political commentary, it is the weakest political commentary in the series. Yes, um, yes. Like, massively, because it, you're right, it doesn't go It just gives up. It yeah. just gives up, yeah, it just stops and it, being and about it. Felt it felt confused with where it even wanted to go with it before. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like, I, I'd say one of the biggest, how does, because still even now, whilst I think the reveal that Comstock is him is interesting. I don't see anything on how he got to Comstock. What do you mean? Like, sure, he was born again after Wounded Knee. After Wounded Knee and the Pinkertons and all the bad shit he did, he sought forgiveness. That which means that at that point you split. You either get a Booker that gets the gets the baptism or Booker that leaves the baptism. Sure. We have been playing as non-baptism Booker. Comstock is post-baptism. Sure, Booker. sure, sure, sure. But how does he then become like I, I feel like just being baptized does not inherently lead you to megalomaniacal hmm? ultra fascist, ultra racist I built a racist city in the sky, Booker. <laughs> well, I don't think it's... You could say that, like, he walks away from the baptism and the next day he wakes up and he's like, I'm Comstock now and I'm going to be racist and be mean. It's, I mean, we know Booker is a piece of shit. You know, the the the, the, the badness was always in him. Yeah. Just Comstock took that and turned it into religious hypocrisy. Do you want me to tell you what happens in the alternate version? Uh, uh, this is the rumor. Yes, I do. Please. Okay, so there is a rumored post on Reddit, I don't have pictures or anything for you, of a version of Bioshock Infinite that did not really do quantum mechanics, time warp, uh, multiverse shit. It was a version which was very much like Bioshock 1 and 2, which is all about the political philosophy, about the racism, about the you know religious patriotism, and it ends very similarly 
Comstock at his fountain, and Booker is a deeply religious man the entire game. Oh. And when he's faced with Comstock, basically he comes here and that whole like, she was your daughter, you bastard, you abandon her. That phrase is, is the line is totally different. And it's, uh, he was your, um, he was your savior, you bastard, and you abandoned him. Talking about how he's moved away from the path of Jesus. Oh. Yeah, and then Elizabeth like opens a, or something happens and somehow he gets pushed into like uh, the moment when Jesus was crucified or something. It's, I'm sorry, uh, what? I don't remember. <laughs> now, what? <laughs> we don't know if that's actually the alternate ending, but that is the rumored alternate Amazing. ending. One of the quote unquote, one of the devs went to Reddit and posted, here's the I alternate mean, That's kind of hysterical if that's the case. Um, it's, it's shit, but it's hysterical. We're going to finish up there. Uh, but before we go, I just want to quickly give a little tease to our final Bioshock episode. Who are you? Name's DeWitt. Is that right? My... <laughs> this one's a real biscuit. Isn't he a biscuit, lady? I need to ask a few questions. Questions, yes. Yes. It is the work of man to ask. It is the work of the artist to answer. What did you think of that tease? <laughs> No birds. And that's going to peak. <laughs> I, think we're, I think the boat has sailed there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, cool. Um, well, I'm excited to cover Burial at Sea next, which is the DLC for Bioshock Infinite. I fucking hate this. We'll talk about why when we get to it. Oh, can't wait. See you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye.